they were alive, or so it seems. Welcome back everyone, this is the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve on the Nintendo Switch, second of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles games, and this is gonna be part 4, we're still on episode 2, although I believe that this will be the end of episode 2, and we're gonna move on to episode 3. 23rd February, 11.32am, the Old Bailey Defendant's Antichamber. Joyful jubilant jumping jacks! He's jubilant. That must be good news. Oh, Mr. Natsume, I'm so pleased for you. Locum student, Mr. Naruhodo Esquire, and non locum judicial assistant, Miss Mikoto by Esquires. Now, finally, at long last, there can be proof. Proof that I'm innocent, and proof that my tea is innocent. Ah, good morning, my dear fellows. Arg, Herolog Sholmes! May you drink my tippy tea and fall forever silent. Thought the tea was innocent. Oh, Mr. Sholmes, you came. How wonderful. Please, save your derision. I know what you are all thinking. Good morning, he says, when it's very nearly time for luncheon. <laughs> your scorn is written clearly across your faces. Nobody said or thought anything of the sort. The truth is, I was determined that today would be the day. As sleep induced... As sleep seduced me last night, I thought, tomorrow, for once, I shall not oversleep. I'll rise early and be present in court to support my companions. Such spirited determination has a beauty all of its own, does it not? Oh, yes. And then I began to muse on the subject. Why do people oversleep? I queried. Why, time after time, do they make the same foolish blunder? And the answer came to me at once. It's so delightfully simple. People oversleep because they sleep. <laughs> well, is that not an astute insight into the matter? Oh, yes. Upon which realization I attempted an experiment. I didn't sleep a wink all night. And the results... By first light, I was exhausted and began to be assailed by, f by fits of drowsiness. <laughs> Shocking. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. And so the conclusion of last night's experiment is this. A good night's sleep is quite simply essential. Yes, I think most of us probably knew that already. What others presuppose I prove by experimentation. That, my dear fellow, is the scientific method. Ah, yes, and one more thing. Do you remember this? Ah! Yes, of course. It's the poison that Miss Green was about to drink at the hospital yesterday. Oh, you didn't manage to... It was a laborious task as the bottle was near empty, but such inconveniences do not hinder Sholmes. I managed to confirm that it contained strychnine. So I was right. Perhaps. Though, of course, such circumstantial evidence doesn't prove Miss Green's guilt. I shall leave the bottle in your care now, but licking the inside of the neck is not recommended. The bottle of poison has been entered into the court record. Ah, uh, could I have a word? Gregson, how good of you to come. Forget it, excuse me. <laughs> Wait a minute, Inspector! I, um, don't wish to make a nuisance of myself. From the look on your face, I'd say it's someone else who you think is making a nuisance of himself. My dear inspector, please, speak freely. Pretend that I'm not here. Believe me, if I could do that, life would be a whole lot simpler for me. <laughs> do you have the results, inspector, of the investigation of Mr. Shamspear's room? Not yet. Shouldn't be long now, though. No, I'm here about something else. That dead convict, actually. Oh, you mean the man from this newspaper article we discovered yesterday in Mr. Shamspear's room? A man by the name of, ah yes, Selden. I went through the archives at the yard and dug out the fellow's file. There's something in there that... Well, it caught my eye. There was a mention of his cellmate. I wonder if it could have been Shamspear. Because that would link him to the previous owner of the of the room that he's that he was so intent on getting for himself. I bet he came out of jail a long time after that guy died. And when he got there, the room was already occupied by by, by another tenant. <coughs> There's something in there that well, it caught my eye. Mm -hmm. Something caught your eye. 
What, Inspector? What? I've copied out the relevant parts for you so you can read it for yourselves. Thank you, the capital offender's file has been entered into the court record. Okay, let me have a look at it. Eighteen counts of burglary, six counts of suspected murder, died of natural causes whilst in prison, his final moments witnessed only by his cellmate, the estimated 1,000 pounds worth of loot he stole remains un un unrecovered. Condemned criminal dies of natural causes in prison. Manchester's Strange Ways Prison, <laughs> that's a strange name indeed, announced the death of convicted murderer and burglar Selden by natural causes in the early hours of this morning. He had been suffering with fever since the end of October. Alerted by the shouts of his fellow cellmates, medical staff arrived to find him already dead before his capital punishment could be carried out. Is it possible that he died not of natural causes, but because his cellmate took care of that? These documents include the details that were in the newspaper cutting we found in Mr. Shamspear's room. I rearranged everything in the court record so we don't have duplicate information. Uh huh. Why are you giving us a copy of this important file, though? Well, you're the ones who turned up the clue in the first place, aren't you? I'm just making sure things get handled in the proper fashion. Oh, Scotland Yard's workings are so wonderful. Indeed, my dear fellows, and the inspector here is a shining diamond in its crown. A shining diamond. In the rough, maybe. <laughs> Look, I just don't want to be beholden to a lawyer, that's all. Counsel for the defense and the defendant. Court proceedings are about to resume. Make your way into the courtroom at once. Well, I shall leave you then. I'll be listening with interest from the public gallery. Not nodding off at all, certainly not. Thank you, Mr. Sholmes. I bet we're gonna hear him snore <laughs> at some point. I'm rather tired of seeing Mr. Mustache in floods of tears personally, so the best of luck to you. Welcome, student, Mr. Naruhodo Esquire. Yes, Mr. Natsume. It's it's time, isn't it? Yes, this is it. Miss Olive Green and Mr. William Shamspear. This is going to be the final battle. <laughs> Hopefully. I won't really have saved Soseki-san until I've exposed the whole truth of everything that's been going on. But it's all coming to a head now. You can do it, Rinosuke. You have to. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session again now. Before the recess, we heard a most startling accusation from the defense. Namely, that the victim of the case we heard here only a few days ago was the true perpetrator of this incident. A reckless, rash and prejudiced charge of wrongdoing in my opinion, my lord. However... The prosecution has tried to extend every courtesy to this amateur newcomer from dubious Eastern Shorts. <laughs> Thank you for that backhanded consideration. A rather cold assessment from the Honorable British Prosecutor, I must say. So, Lord Van Zeeks, is the new witness present and ready to take the stand? Ready and waiting in the witness's antechamber, my lord. Very well. Bailiff, bring the witnesses in. She's painting, even now. Witnesses, state your names and occupations for the court, please. William Shamspear, my liege. My, for my occupation, I can say only that I'd be a tragic victim to be pitied. Currently unemployed, in other words. I'm Olive Green. I'm a fledgling artist. Well, no, not a fledgling, really. A hopeless failure who's too weak-spirited to admit she has no talent, I suppose. Also currently unemployed, in other words. What a what? A cut, coterie? Coterie? You don't know what that means. Mr. Shamspear. My lord, I am thy humble servant. I'm afraid that you are no longer merely the victim in this affair. The possibility has been raised that you are in fact the assailant intent on taking the life of your fellow lodger. The part you have played in this whole business will be thoroughly scrutinized, I assure you. 
I would for not else, my lord. And Miss Green? Yes? You are aware of the reason you have been summoned to this courtroom today, I presume? Yes, the officer did explain. He said I poisoned this ridiculous buffoon. <laughs> and do you accept the charge, Miss Green? I don't know anything about any poisoning. And I don't know anything about this man. We're gonna have to establish the link between these two already, to begin with, before we even attempt to... ...try to expose what really transpired. Come, lady, die to live. Verily, I know not I know not thy prickly pee pigmented personage. Personage? Personage? I'm not, I know how you say that. Very well, let us proceed with the matter in hand. That being to ascertain whether or not Miss Green has any involvement in this affair. It's all very strange, very strange indeed. Why would you suspect me? I barely ever go to the East End anyway. It so happens that I passed by in that neighborhood six days ago, that's all. I think the reason you passed by is because this is where your fiancé used to live until his demise. And on the night that this man was poisoned, I was still in hospital fighting for my life. She could have poisoned it a long time before. Yes, having been unfortunately caught up in the incident on the street outside the Garrett household. An incident that rendered you unconscious for some three days. I was struck in the middle of my back with a knife, th through no fault of my own, and now I'm under suspicion? What other irrelevant things might I be suspected of? It's all very disturbing. Hmm, your energies may be better spent worrying about random knife attacks, I feel, Mrs. Green. <laughs> At this point in time, all that appears to connect you with Mr. Shamspear's lodgings is the Briar Road incident of six days ago. That's why we would like you to testify formally now about exactly what happened. Oh no, the incident six days ago? Y you mean you want me to relive that awful accident? Unfortunately, yes. Please tell the court what happened that day. And of course, we will be interested to hear from you about your movements that day too, Mr. Shamspear. Eh, but, but what happened six days ago has nothing to do with me being poisoned. Let us proceed then. The witnesses will present their formal testimony to the court. On the subject of the incident that took place on Briar Road the evening of the 17th of February. I'm interested in knowing first why she was in the neighborhood. I mean, I, we already know it, wasn't it? She was invited to a, a restaurant or something like that on that night. No? Or something like that, but the court doesn't know that yet, so I think that should be brought to light. It was six days ago at about 5 p.m. I was walking along in the snow when I was suddenly stabbed in the back. Coincidentally, it happened to be just outside the house where the men in this case have their lodgings. I was at the tavern on the eve of which those beakists for I had bespoke my supper. It was the first time I'd been in the area. I had a little matter to attend to, that's all. I think that's a lie that it was the first time. Anyway, I was admitted straight to hospital, so I knew nothing about all of this business. Yes, a second incident inside a week at what I believe to be aptly described as the haunted lodgings. One can only presume this is a most unfortunate coincidence. Meanwhile, you say you were not in your room, Mr. Shamspear. It was the following morn when I did awaken that I learned of the dire events. Mary! What a commotion did the officers of the law make on the floor above mine. When toseki san was arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. As suspected, there is nothing connecting these two witnesses but happened sense. It's true, it does seem as though they're unrelated at first glance, but I'm not so sure. There's something lurking in the shadows here, I feel certain of it. So this is the angle of attack here, it's uh, exposing the connection between the two. Her fiancé lived upstairs from uh, the, the from, from Shamsphere. We have to expose it. And this is my one and only chance to expose it. Counsel, you may now cross-examine these two witnesses if you wish. Yes, my lord. 
I think it's the the statement where she says uh, that she had never been in the neighborhood before that I have to press uh, first and foremost. It was six days ago at about 5 p.m. I was walking along in the snow and I was suddenly standing back. Yeah, let's skip over. Yeah, it was the first time I'd been in the area. I had a little matter to attend to that, so we don't have evidence yet of that, I guess. No? No, because we don't have the, the letter that she had before. We only have this piece of the torn envelope. So pr let's press then. What well, little matter, Miss Green? Please elaborate. It was nothing really, it's not worth mentioning. If you remember, you mentioned it to us yesterday at the hospital. Ah, <laughs> I haven't forgotten. It was related to the card you were holding. <laughs> Miss Green! What was that? She clearly just hit something behind her back. From memory, I believe the card contained a note that read, I have information regarding the death of Duncan Ross. What does that matter? This has nothing to do with Duncan. Duncan. Ha 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 Mr. Shamspear, do you have something to share with the court? To be or not to be, that is the question. Ah, pray forgive me, the great bard's words springeth from within me with narrow thought. Don't tell me, it's because you're possessed by Shakespeare's spirit, right? <sighs> Hearing Miss Green's words a moment ago seemed to make you think of something. Something of relevance, perhaps? Eh, eh um, well, nay, nay, sire. It was nothing at all. Presumably you know the name, though. Mr. Duncan Ross, I mean. After all, you are both lodgers in the same house. I would it were so, but sadly nay. Lodging be a lonely occupation, sire. My lodging fellows be rarely known to me. So you haven't heard of him, even though he passed away in the room just one floor above yours. From gas poisoning, we should note. From his gas stove going out in the middle of the night from someone blowing in the pipe. No? Doesn't ring a bell at all? Come on, Naruhodo. You could do better than that. You could say all these things. Hmm, Miss Green. Me, my lord? Have I done something wrong? The card that was mentioned before containing the note, do you have it upon your person? I do, yes, but I don't need it anymore. In fact, I should throw it away, really. Before you dispose of it, the court will take it as evidence, please. Miss Green's card has been entered into the court record. Let's examine it immediately. Of, of course, that's what links Mr. Shamspear and Miss Green. Yeah, the other end of the envelope was found in Mr. Shamspear's room, so... Uh, maybe she dropped it, actually. Come to think of it. The envelope has been ripped open rather carelessly, hasn't it? Miss Green strikes me as the type to open correspondence more neatly than that. Is it possible that it was Sham Spear who did it? Ah, what is it? The way the envelope is torn. I'm almost sure I've seen that exact same shape somewhere else. Oh, you don't mean... Were you thinking of this piece of evidence, Mr. Naruhodo? Exactly, that's it. Try to match them up. They go together perfectly. This torn off end of the envelope clearly belongs to this with this card. Uh huh. Okay. A note in an envelope that seems to have been ripped up open rather roughly. The envelope fits perfectly with the torn off piece found at the scene of the crime. Okay. They've both been updated. Uh, is there anything else of note? The contents of the message, perhaps? No. It's Duncan Ross. Now, continue with your testimony, please, Miss Green. Anyway, I was admitted straight to hospital, so I knew nothing about all of this business. Hmm. 
Oh, Mr. Narohodo, you pursued Mr. Shamspear wonderfully there. It's worked out well, hasn't it? We have a new clue at last. Alright, now I need to pull off a really insightful objection somewhere. Well, as you've managed to expose this promising new angle, I wonder if you should perhaps try to develop that. Ah, uh, yes, of course. And yelling out objections isn't necessarily the best way to do that, I suppose. What was that, by the way, our last statement? I knew nothing about all of this business. Okay. I was at the tavern on the eve of which thou speakest, for I had bespoke my supper. You had bespoke your supper? A tavern, you say? Which one? It was the slug and salad where I did tarry. There's a jewel in the east end. And a little unexpected, I feel. Hmm? What do you mean, Lord Van Zeeks? The slug and salad offers unusually fine dining, for the locality at least. Not an establishment you'd expect to be patronized by a man with not even a crumb of bread in his room. It's true, the menu lists premium crusts of bread and glasses of water in different levels of cloudiness. <laughs> I would have expected Grub's Grubbery in the local vicinity to be more... appropriate for your means. You mean he's been lying? And Grub's Grubbery, isn't that the name that was mentioned in the note? There was a... a kind of restaurant mentioned in the note before, but since I can't read it now... Or can I? Maybe. No, it's only the fact that it goes with the other part of the envelope that's uh, highlighted by the, the court record. I would have expected Grub's Grubbery, yeah, okay. Watery soup and mushy peas. Or rather, soupy water and pea like mush. <laughs> All equally appetizing. I just wanted to try some water in a different pub for once. What's wrong with that? How different can water really be? Or perhaps there is a more plausible explanation. A specific reason why he had to go to that particular establishment. Agreed. The fact that on that day of all days he dined at a place he wouldn't normally. It does stand out. Because she was there, no? She was supposed to go to the place that got uh, Van Zeke's mansion, Grub's Grubbery or something. So Mr. Shamspear's own actions on the day of the incident six days ago were slightly suspicious. I wonder if we have some evidence that can explain those actions. It would be the note, I think, but I have to say before that because I can't verify that this was in the note. And since I heard of it yesterday, I've kind of already forgotten by now. Mr. Shamspear. Yes, sire? I bet he walked by the restaurant and saw her on the inside and didn't want to be seen. On the day in question, is it not the case that you visited the Slug and Salad, the place you don't normally patronize, for a very particular reason? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Pray, if thou hast some purpose, speakest. <laughs> Very well, I will present the court with evidence. Evidence that explains why you had to be at the slug and salad that day, namely... I think. No? I b yeah, okay, I think we're, we're on the right track. I believe this card reveals the answer. Good lord, Miss Green's card, you mean? That's right, my lord. It reads, I have information regarding the death of Duncan Ross. Come to the slug and salad on Briar Road at 5 p.m. on the 17th. Don't tell anybody else about this letter or the meeting. It is a matter of utmost importance. Mr. Shamspear, your actions on the afternoon of Miss Green's stabbing are exactly as described in this note. Ah. Uh. Personally, I find it hard to believe that's a coincidence. Don't you, Mr. Shamspear? Um, well... Excuse me. Can I say something? Yes, Miss Green? That card was delivered to me. Not him. It doesn't have anything to do with this odd man, does it? But the other end of the envelope... ...was found in his room. Well, well, you'd think so, yes, but it's hard to believe it's merely... My lord, may I? May you what, Miss Green? I'd like to make something very clear about that card. 
She's gonna am uh, yeah, amend her testimony, yeah. To include details about the, pecu the peculiar note. This note was delivered to me at my address. It's nothing to do with the odd man next to me here. I don't believe you because the other half of the envelope was found... Or do I present the other half, maybe? On this one. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah. The day before the incident, exactly one week ago now, this note was delivered to your address. And upon carrying out the instructions in the note, you found yourself in the hospital. Yes, I did. It's terrible, everything that's happened to me. Yes, it is terrible. If it's all true, that is. What do you mean? Miss Green, have a look at this, please. It's the torn off end of an, of an envelope. Oh, is it? Yeah, like, th that's not already obvious. And it so happens that it fits together perfectly with the envelope of the note you received. W -w 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 -where, where did you find that? In Mr. Shamspear's room. Eh? In my room? That either connects him to her, or her to his room, anyway. So, one way or another, these two are connected. We've, uh... We've already established that, at least. That's good and proven at this point. Mr. Shamspear, do you perhaps remember this note from somewhere? Uh, well... Your actions that afternoon follow the instructions in the note to the letter. Come to the Slug and Salad on Briar Road at 5 p.m. on the 17th, and so that's exactly where you went. Or did she... Did she go back, maybe? To get the... To get the letter and the envelope, but she could not find the missing part of the of the envelope, or maybe she she thought nothing of it, like uh, that could never be connected back to her, and so she left it behind. I'm not exactly sure how everything fits together yet, but uh, I have a broad idea of what happened. Let me ask you again, Mr. Shamspear. You already knew about this one, didn't you? And you, Miss Green. Ah, what did I do? As this torn off end of the envelope proves, the note was originally in Mr. Shamspear's room, so how is it that it came to be in your possession? I-I don't have the first idea, I'm just a fledgling artist after all. <laughs> there is only one explanation! You broke into Mr. Shamspear's room and stole it! You did what? Sorry, the last what? You broke- I mean, thou were in my room? <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> He's having trouble speaking in the same speech pattern as usual, I see. Losing his calm, I see. What on earth do you want with me? It would seem that both witnesses need to testify again. Arrgh. Miss Green. Yes, whilst you have the court's sympathy, I'm sure, for the suffering you have end endured in recent events, Anyone found to be given f giving false testimony in the court of law will be duly punished. Please bear that in mind. I think if she is found to be the real murderer, she's risking a lot more than she does for lying, so... Uh, yes, I know, she says. Very well then, witnesses, you will give formal testimony again now. On the subject of this curious anomaly regarding the note Miss Green claims to have received. The anomaly of the note. I do remember now, it was a week ago, per adventure, that note was delivered onto me. On the day writ therein, I did tarry a long hour at the slug and salad, yet nobody came. But that's not where the note said you had to go. No? Or was it? Was it not the other one? Thereafter, on the evening, I shared the company of the Japanese fellow. I did see the note had vanished. I don't know what you mean. You think I snuck into this man's room, do you? Why would I? I can point out the villain here, and as for that torn off piece of the envelope, I don't know anything about it. Hmm. This testimony is gonna be harder to break, I feel. Hmm, you now claim to have received this letter to you, Mr. Shamspear. Faith, this so, my lord. And I would swear to have set it upon the table in my humble lodgings. Yet, it is clear to me now that since I returned from the tavern that night, I have not laid eyes upon it. Hmm, well, that being the case, young lady, it would appear that your testimony was a lie. Is that what you think? 
How unfair of you to think I'm the one lying. I beg your pardon? I'm just a fledgling artist, as I said, and fledgling artists don't lie. Uh, is there a rule book somewhere that says it is so? That note was delivered to me at my address. Besides, we all know who the liar around here is. If that's true, Miss Green, how would you explain the facts? This part of the envelope was without question found in Mr. Shamspear's room. I don't see why I should explain. Sorry? I am a fledgling artist. My job here is just to say what happens. That's all. It's your job to give the explanations and the proofs. You, the fledgling lawyer. The fledgling will do his best. <laughs> Evidently, my learned friend's cross-examination is our only hope of learning the truth. Well, counsel, I'll do my best, my lord, uh, what can I say? Very well, then, the defense will now proceed with the cross-examination of the witnesses. Miss Green clearly did break into Mr. Shamspear's room, there can be no question of that. And that's how she acquired the note. Yes, two facts that are starting to lead me to a possible explanation for all this. It's not a pretty one. The anomaly of the note. Yeah, let me save again, perhaps before I attempt anything here. <sighs> okay, the no he says the note was delivered to him. On the day writ therein, I did tarry a long hour at the slug and salad, yet nobody came. If you try to think about how it was delivered, why, and why it was given a... Uh, uh, a meeting, a rendezvous, I guess. Uh, an appointment in that restaurant. Maybe she slid it under his door. She delivered the message, maybe. To get him to go there, and then she, what, she... To get him to go, to get outside of his apartment, so that she could sneak in? She had a long hour to sneak into the, the apartment and lay the strychnine around the... The pipe of the, of the lamp, no? Isn't that possible? Ah, perhaps, perhaps. She would need him to be outside to, for, for, to be able to sneak in. So even after waiting for an hour, nobody appeared? Well, um, yes, sire. Tis as thou sayest. Really, you paused for a moment before you answered. In truth, when thou asked whether nobody appeared, I did suddenly recall. Really? Do you mean to tell the court that somebody did appear after all? I was not alone that night at the Slug and Salad, my lord. No, this returning to me now. I did treat my lips to almost clear water. Almost clear water. And mine innards to a premium crust of bread. And all around me danced the great many companions. What do you mean? Flies, sire, flies. Good lord. In the name of Beelzebub, lord of the flies. Where, what were they? Fairies, perchance, from a Midsummer Night's Dream, come to taunt me? I think they were just flies. Can't help thinking that the flies ought to choose something more wholesome to, bu to buzz around. Is that wrong of me? Okay, well, pressing here doesn't seem to have yielded, uh... Anything interesting. Thereafter, on the evening, I shared the company of the Japanese fellow. I did see the note had vanished. Well, yeah, she if, if she did sneak into the apartment after he left to put the strychnine around the pipe, she would have taken the envelope with her to remove from the scene any link to her between her and the apartment. That makes sense. When exactly did you notice it had gone missing? Such idle thoughts never occupy my mind. I am busied with greater ideas. In other words, you didn't notice. Several days passed between your outing to the tavern and Mr. Natsume's visit to your room. Yes, it would appear that the note disappeared sometime in that interval. Such idle thoughts never occupy my mind. I am busied with greater ideas. And yet during that time, Miss Green was comatose in hospital, was she not? Uh... 
Is that really the case? Clearly then, she could not have been stealing things from Mr. Shamspear's room. Ah, uh, yes, yes, of course. It's, it's all some sort of misunderstanding, isn't it, Mr. Prosecutor, sir? You have so far failed to give a satisfactory explanation as to how you came by the note. <laughs> I am not here to advocate for your defense, madam. I won't tolerate inconsistencies in your, th in your story. Actually, uh, the more I think back to it, when we found her with the note and the bottle in hand in our, in our uh, hospital room, I'm thinking now that maybe she wanted revenge, but then maybe she wanted to commit suicide, not because she was ashamed of what she attempted to do to this guy, but, be but because she wanted to be with the man she loved. She wanted to rejoin him, maybe. Maybe it was not shame, because now she's lying and denying it. So, it it's not like she's really showing a lot of remorse right now, trying to hide the fact. So maybe it was more sadness that her uh, lover was gone, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, n now that I think about it, that sounds a bit more plausible. I am not here to advocate for your defense, madam. I won't tolerate inconsistencies in your story. You would do well to remember that. Oh, dearie me. What's Lord Vanzeek's getting at? Inconsistencies? You think I snuck into this man's room? Why would I? Should I present something here? Now that I already have a hunch. Ah, well, there we go. <laughs> That's the thing. I was on the right track! Yesterday at the hospital, we saw you with this bottle, and though the contents spilt during the course of our meeting, a small quantity remained. Ah! According to the defense's in independent analysis, Mr. Sholmes' chem chemistry said, but let's not tell them that, otherwise it will not be accepted as evidence. The liquid that was still in the bottle was identified as strychnine. What? Strychnine? The very same poison that afflicted Mr. Shamspear? Ah! Miss Green, you broke into this man's lodgings for one reason and one reason alone. To cover the end of the pipe that feeds the gas lamp in Mr. Shamspear's room with poison. Can, can this be? You broke into my room? To... It may seem incredible to the court, but from the remaining clues there is only one logical conclusion that we can reach. The person who attempted to take Mr. Shamspear's life with poison was you, Miss Olive Green! Oh dear, oh dear, oh dearie! Me! Ho hold on, hold on! Counsel, are you seriously suggesting this woman put poison on the end of the gas pipe with intent to kill? Yes, my lord. There's no other way to explain the facts. Now we're gonna get to the motive part, I guess. No? And I'm gonna have to point out that it is because the other guy killed her lover or something. And she found out how. Yes, my lord, there's no other way to explain the facts. But if Miss Green did indeed set this odious trap six days ago, and the victim had put his mouth to the pipe that very evening as expected, the attempted murder would have happened six days ago, surely. Uh, if he didn't put his mouth around the pipe in the interval, no, not necessarily, maybe. She didn't know when he would die. And... Six days ago, was she in the hospital at... that time? Um, well, that's a very good point. <laughs> Perhaps not, my lord. I beg your pardon? There was a significant police presence in the area that evening on account of the incident on, in, on Briar Road. Local residents were being interviewed throughout the night as part of the ongoing inquiry. A circumspect criminal would likely have chosen not to carry out any wrongdoing at that time. Lord Van Zeeks. And of course, the following morning there was more activity at Mr. Shamspear's address. More activity? Ah, uh, yes. You mean his fellow lodger Mr. Natsume being arrested on suspicion of murder. 
That's right, and as the defense has already proposed, Mr. Shamspear was meddling with the gas in the pipe for a very sinister reason himself. To cause the gas stove in Mr. Natsume's room to go out, thereby asphyxiating the occupant. But once Mr. Natsume had been arrested, his room was under constant surveillance by the police. In the circumstances, Mr. Shamspear had no reason to blow air into the gas pipe. His intended victim being in a prison cell. Ah. Well, it's good of Van Zeeks to point out that there was another explanation. With the need to temper with the gas removed, the poison on the pipe lay dormant. And then, three days ago now, the situation changed again. And that explains why she was in the neighborhood that night, then. What she was doing there, maybe. And then, three days ago now, the situation changed again. Right, Ms. Anatomy's trial, which took place here at the Old Bailey, came to an end. The trial in which the man stood accused of stabbing Miss Green in the back, but was duly acquitted. That resulted in Mr. Natsume returning to his lodgings for the first time in two days. And that very night, his gas stove mysteriously went out, and Mr. Shamspear was mysteriously poisoned. Sorry. <clears throat> in conclusion, the poison that was present on the mouth of the gas pipe... ...had been put there in the victim's room some four days earlier. Mary! With that new understanding, it becomes clear that this letter was all part of the plan. What plan? To get him to leave his apartment. The court will recall that the notes gave instructions with to visit the slug and salad at 5 o'clock and that the recipient should tell nobody else. The reason for those instructions are now clear. To ensure that the lodger would not be at home at the stated time. To make sure I wasn't home? Exactly. And like I said, she had to get rid of the note. I mean, in this case, she should have truly gotten rid of it, not keep it. <laughs> but she didn't want to leave it uh, on site. While you were out, Miss Green could safely slip into your room, knowing that she wouldn't be disturbed. Y you mean to say that letter was written by Miss Green, yes. And in order to cover her tracks, she took it away with her when she left. But she left the bit of the envelope behind. Just after she smeared poison over the mouth of the gas pipe in your room. Horda, Horda, what do you have to say for yourself, witness? She's gonna b b go about, uh, wh why would I do that? Probably. The next step would be to expose the motive, I think. Just who are you? Why did you try to kill me? Exactly, yeah, there we go, that's where we're, what we're getting at. Miss Green's motive should be obvious. It's all tied up with someone whose name we've heard several times already dur during the course of this trial. So that's what behind all that's what's behind all this. You will share your apparent understanding with the court, please, counsel. Which person is behind this woman's motive for the attack on the victim's life? This guy. Duncan Ross? That's right, before the defendant, Mr. Natsume, took up precedence in the lodgings at Mr. Garrett Ebb's, somebody else was renting the room. Mr. Duncan Ross. I knew I'd heard the name somewhere else. It was all over the paper a month ago, when the man died in strange circumstances at the haunted lodgings. Hmm, that does ring a vague... Ah, of course, yes, I remember now. The young man they claimed was strangled by the convict's curse or some such. Sadly, my lord, it wasn't a curse of any kind, nor was it an accident. The man died as a result of Mr. Shamspear blowing into the gas pipe and causing gas to leak into the room. It was murder, plain and simple. Ah! Ha, 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 ha. Well, what do you know? The world is so unfair. Curses. Curious death. That's all people care about. If it's an interesting story they want to know, it doesn't cross their minds that real people are involved. And once they're, get the, they're bored, just one month later, once the story's lost its appeal, everyone's forgotten him. You... you mean you... Duncan was... Mr. Ross was Miss Green's fiancé. <laughs> fi fiancé? <laughs> you may not have known until now who Miss Green really is, Mr. Shamspear. But she's not exactly who you are all along, because you're her sworn enemy. 
The murderer who took the life of the man she was to marry. Marry? <laughs> Miss Green, is it not the case that in order to exact revenge on Mr. Shamspear, you smeared poison over the end of the gas pipe? Something tells me it's not gonna be over that easily. Because we still haven't exposed the motive for him trying to kill Duncan Ross and uh, Natsume. This this is all quite extraordinary. Am I correct in my understanding that you now accuse both parties' counsel, each on different counts of murder? Yes, my lord. That's correct. Idioti! Inhaling so deeply, it appears that my fledgling learned friend has taken in a lung full of dubious gas that's causing his judgment to be clouded. What? We're getting to it, Van Zeeks. Uh, hold, hold on to your chalice for a second. <laughs> you have completely failed to provide a motive to substantiate your accusation against the man. Let's get to it. <laughs> yes, that's right, Mr. Reaper, my leech. I, I have been slighted. This lies, all lies. I deny every utterance. And you'll have to forgive me, Mr. Naruhodo, sir. But I don't intend to admit to anything either. Miss Green. I'm sure you'll think I'm being very rude, but... I'm not going to be sent to the gallows for the likes of this scoundrel. But you broke into the man's room. If you didn't do it to smear poison on the pipe, what was your reason? I thought I'd have a look around, that's all. Uh, sorry? You're right, I suspected him, so I thought perhaps I might find some evidence or something in his room. Evidence that it was him who took Duncan's life. Oh, vileness. Oh, villainy. Oh, tyranny. Oh, rotundity of a man, of, of, of woman. <laughs> now, now this is plain rude. But in any case, whenever I leave my room, I do turn the key in the lock. What about that key around our neck? What's that? What kind of key is that? That whole place is falling apart. The locks on the doors are no different. Duncan showed me once how to unlock the door with some turps and a piece of wire. Ah, okay. Oh, hopefulness. Oh, heartfulness. Oh, tyranny. Oh, profanity of woman. We will consider your trespassing on some future occasion, but for now, tell the court what you found, what evidence you ser your search revealed. Well, I spotted a note that I had sent him lying on the floor. When I went to pick it up, I noticed something. One of the floorboards was loose, and underneath it I discovered a secret hiding place. Did you take whatever was in the box? Eh? Yes, we also discovered that hiding place. Inside, we found a newspaper cutting and a photograph and an empty tin box. Ah, uh, yes. Well, the thing is, when I found it, the box wasn't empty. Uh, we're getting somewhere. There was something in it. What was it? <laughs> Testify. That key? This rather nice key. Ah! So that's what the key was. What are you doing with that? What the... Every ounce of color has drained from his face. Give it here! Give it to me now! It's mine! I inherited it! I bet you he was the, the cellmate of, of Selden. And he inherited it from the guy. Or he says he inherited it, but maybe he killed the guy to take it and, and steal it. For, for all we know. We may not necessarily know all the facts there either. They say he died of natural cause, but uh... Is there gas in the cells, actually? In British prisons? Gas lamps or something? But then the cellmate would have died too. Yeah, yeah, so the, pr probably not then. That's probably not it. Plus it's not an enclosed space, I guess. There would be bars, I guess. Unless not, I don't know what the British uh, prison cells would have looked like at that time, so... What was that witness? What did you say? You inherited it? From whom? Um, no, I, uh... What's all this about? He inherited that key? It was obviously important to you since you'd gone to such lengths to hide it, so I took it. I don't know what it's for, but you took something precious from me, so I took something precious from you. 
So what if it means you can't open something now? I don't care. You took something precious from me, so she she's saying that she knows that it was him who killed it. Who, who killed Duncan. So what if it means you can't open something now? I don't care. <laughs> Give it back this minute! Give it to me! It's something to do with the loot, I tell you! not forget to turn back on the mic. Speaking of which... Uh, yeah, right, okay, so I can monitor the sound. Calm yourself, witness. So Mr. Shamspear has tried, and in one case succeeded, to take the life of two lodgers now. Yes, his motive for doing so is the key to everything that's happened. It's true that there appears to be no motive to support the accusation against Mr. Shamspear at first, but considering everything we now know, I think there is actually something that could explain it. What? I need to recall every piece of evidence at our disposal, everything we've seen and heard. Because I'm sure that I just caught a glimpse of the link that runs through all these events. I wonder if Olive knows what the key is for, though. I wonder... Is it possible that Duncan knew about the... About the loot as well? And told her when he was alive? Could it be? In that case, counsel, I must demand that you present evidence to the court in support of your claim. What is it that you say can explain the motivation for Mr. Shamspear's alleged, alleged, alleged crime? Uh huh. I think that's it. That's an official police report, is it not? The Selden file? How did you get hold of that? S Selden? The now sadly deceased Mr. Ross and the defendant Mr. Natsume have only one thing linking them. The fact that they had lodgings in the same room. Well, yes, we know this, certainly. A room that was formerly occupied by Selden. Until that is, he was arrested by Scott Yandard for his involvement in multiple burglaries. Hmm, I see. And it so happens that the convict Selden left behind one very substantial mystery when he died. That the s the s the some one thousand pounds worth of loot that he stole, which has yet remains to be found. Ah, yes, of course. It's coming back to me now. It's written in this file here. A thousand pounds lost en route to hell. That was how the papers summed it up. And it seems that one particular fellow inmate was with the convict in his final moments. It's not hard to imagine Selden entrusting that inmate with his most closely guarded secret. The location of the stolen loot and perhaps a key to unlock whatever container the valuables were in. Ah, uh, you, you mean this key is... Uh, maybe she didn't know, after all, what the key was to. Mr. Shamspear, it was you, wasn't it? You were at the capital offender's side when he died, were you not? Uh... Oh, what are you talking about? This is a false charge, I tell you, a false charge. That should be easy enough to check. Yeah, it's not noted in this file, but we could ask the prison, they would know. Assuming Shamspear is his real name. Admittedly. Because it sounds suspiciously like a made-up name in the heat. <laughs> a simple telegram to the prison where he died would quickly tell us how false the charge really is. Uh, uh. <laughs> That's what I said, yeah. But, but even if it's true, why would the man be so intent on killing every subsequent occupant of the convict's lodgings? Because he wants the room for himself. There's only one explanation for that, my lord. It was in that very room that Selden hid his loot. So it all comes out. Yes, and having established that, all of Mr. Shamspear's subsequent actions start to make perfect sense. When he was let out of prison following Selden's death, he made immediately for Mr. Garadab's lodgings in the hope of renting Selden's old room. Yeah, and Mr. Garadab told us that he insisted on getting that room, but there was already Duncan living in it. Because between the time that the guy died in, in prison, 
I mean, bet between the time that the guy uh, was arrested, Selden, and then he died in prison, and maybe uh, Shamspear was released. Uh, how many weeks or months had uh, the room ho already been rented to someone else? However, the retired army man was unable to offer him the accommodation of his choice. Because Selden's old room had already been let to somebody else. Mr. Duncan Ross, yeah, exactly. Ah, which is why Mr. Shamspear subsequently devised this gas-based plot to kill the occupant of the room. Yeah, but... Natsume was very quick to come and request the room after the other guy died. Within hours, I think, of the, of the room being free, in fact, so... That must have been very frustrating for Shamspear. And when he was successful, he presumably intended to inquire about switching into the newly vacant room. However, a certain jittery someone had beaten him to it. Mr. Soseki Natsume, the defendant of this case, no less. So you decided to use the ploy with the gas again, didn't you, Mr. Shamspear? This time to house Mr. Natsume. All for one simple and avaricious reason, to get your hands on the thousand pounds of loot left behind by the dead convict. Ah, uh, you... Ah! Uh, ah! Looks like I'm gonna snuff it before they get to stretch me neck. Listen. I want you to have me loot anything to stop the coppers getting their mitts on it. It's hidden in the room where I was lodging when they got me. Here, this is the key to it. Take it. So he really did die of natural cause then? Always stay one step ahead, mate. See you in hell, I guess. Shamspear. And that was his real name? It's mine! What did he just say? It's mine! That loot is mine! Oh boy, oh boy! <laughs> Mr. Shamspear, it's all lies. I don't accept any of it. Why should I? After all, you don't have a shred of evidence. You can't prove I killed that fellow. Forsooth, I'm the victim here, remember? Isn't that right, ladies and gentlemen? If I don't admit to it, there's nothing you can do. You can't arrest me. For the time being, anyway. Fairly, you can't arrest the victim, can you? Isn't that right, ladies and gentlemen? I'm so close, I just need a few more hours. I swore to myself that I'd get my hands on it. And I can almost taste it now. Do you really think I'd just give up? There's no question in my mind now, this man is guilty through and through. <laughs> but he seems so utterly intoxicated by the idea of that loot. I'm afraid that however hard you press him, he'll never admit to what he's done, Mr. Naruhodo. Hmm, there is a way. Pardon? There's one way I can finish him. No. He's already committed the most heinous crimes to get his hands on that loot, which means all we need to do is find it first. A fine plan, were it not for the fact that the police thoroughly searched the room following the death of Mr. Ross. If it's there at all, it must be very well hidden indeed. Without conclusive evidence, I certainly cannot rule. If only, if only there was some way we could find the convinced the convict's loot quickly. Uh, this is the final piece in this complex puzzle. Well, Sholmes' uh, handprint thingy, that tool, no? Maybe? I think we might have it in our possession already, but I don't have that in my... Uh, I don't have that in my court record.
actually the, the real cause of death, uh, the real natural cause of his death uh, it was, was uh, written there in plain letters all along. He had been suffering with fever since the end of October, yeah, well there, there you go. Alerted by the shouts of his fellow cellmates, medical staff arrived to find him already dead. Hmm. Hmm. I think we might have it in our possession already, or rather, I think we we may well have something that can help us find where that loot is hidden. My lord. Yes, counsel? The defense would like to make a proposal about how to find the late convict's hidden, hidden loot. I believe we are already in possession of something that could give us a clue as to its whereabouts. It's our last chance, so it has to be worth a gamble. Besides, we've used the same technique once already, and it definitely paid off then. I think this is, they're getting to the Sholm's uh, device that shows uh, hand prints, or skin prints. Very well then, counsel. Let the court hear your idea. What do you propose we can use in order to locate the hiding place of the diseased convict's hole? I don't have the device with me, but I have the picture that shows the, the method. If I'm not mistaken, those are Mr. Shamspear's handprints on the wall of his lodgings. That's right, my lord. Exposed as a result of the defense's independent investigation of the scene. Based on a wonderful new discovery in the field of forensic science by the great detective Mr. Sholmes. A great detective? Is that some kind of joke? <laughs> Do you really think I'm going to be daunted by a man with such a ridiculous title? I should think the great bard ought to recognize such a title when he hears one, Mr. Sham Spear. <laughs> Perhaps we should compete for the honor of our most ridiculous title. <laughs> What's he doing there? Ah! This Sherlock Holmes himself! What are you doing here, great detective? Your usual haunts are the filthy back streets of the capital, are they not? Ah, uh, Mr. Reaper, it's been too long, and I see your complexion has worsened since last we met. <laughs> Mr. Sholmes, he does know Lord Van Zeeks, then. Well enough to say something like that, in any case. Mr. Sholmes, though you may be heralded as a great detective by the population at large, you have no right to be there. That does not give you the right to come and go in my courtroom as you see fit. If I may, my lord, Mr. Sholmes' newly developed scientific method has helped us to uncover vital clues in this case already. Clues, you say? I call them skin prints, my lord. My method identifies every location touched by an individual under scrutiny. It's the method by which we were able to ascertain this gentleman's gas pipe activities. <laughs> ah, you need only a small sample of something the individual has previously touched to make the, an indicator solution. In your case, sir, I used the teacup you had been holding. Elementary! <laughs> so now, Mr. Naruhodo. Ah, yes. What am I to use as a sample to make the indicator solution this time? Uh, the key? Thank you for offering to help Mr. Sholmes. When the convict was arrested, he was living in what is now Soseki-san's room. We need a sample to help locate Seldon's loot that's hidden in his old room. What form will the sample take? Um, olive green for the key. Hold on, I'm gonna save. The key she has around her neck, I should say. We will need something of Seldon's in order to create the indicator solution to find this loot, and something the convict owned happens to be in the possession of somebody listed in the court record, and she's right there. Upon my word, Mr. Naruhodo, your powers of reasoning appear to be on the up. So which particular person do you have in mind? From whom can we obtain the possession of the late convict Selden to create the indicator solution? Miss Green. Oh, me? What do you want with me? The key around your neck. There we go. If you please. Sorry? That key belonged to Selden. There will be remnants of secretion from the man's skin on its surface that we can use. Very true. But there would be those of other people too.
but it doesn't matter, I guess. The solution would work for all three, for uh, Olive, for Shamspear, and for Selden as well. And, oh yeah, but Olive has been in, a, in the room of her uh, lover before, I guess, no? So the Herb Prince would be in there as well, I would expect. Mm. I don't know. That is the sample we need. Using it, we can create the indicator solution required for Mr. Sholmes' skin print seeker. And find out exactly what Selden touched in the room that he used to rent. Mr. Shamspear, as one great to another, I assure you, if the late convict's hole is hidden somewhere in his former lodgings, I shall uncover it in no more than 30 minutes. So, Mr. Shamspear, the truth is well within our grasp now, and as such, you will never get your hands on Selden's stolen wealth. Uh, uh, arg! In that ca case, I'll gladly let Mr. Sholmes have this key. No! Give the key to me! The detective shan't have it! It's over, Mr. Shamspear. No! No! You're out of options now. There's only one thing left for you to do. Admit your guilt. Whoa. Oh, shamful spear! Despair! Be thy name! Is he gonna admit now? I never intended to kill the man. I just... I just wanted to drive him out of the room. That's all. So you'd have time to find the convict's hole of stolen goods. Yet after you'd killed the young man, you still didn't move into the room. I asked the landlord, of course. I pleaded with him, but he refused. Why? I was three months behind with the rent for one thing. Mr. Garrett up really has had a lot to put up with. And he had the gas repair work done immediately afterwards, putting the room out of action for a while. And then this Japanese man swooped in at just the right moment to sign the new lease. Poor Mr. Natsume, what unfortunate timing. Then five days ago, after the incident on Briar Road when the Japanese fellow got himself arrested, I thought I'd finally have my chance, but it wasn't to be. No, the scene was sealed off and guarded by the police night and day. And if I remember rightly, Mr. Sholmes spent the whole day in there reading books. I couldn't even enter the room, let alone search for the loot. Which is why on the day Mr. Natsume was acquitted and returned to his room, you once again tried your trick of blowing air into the gas pipe that feeds the stove in his room. Unbeknownst to you, however, that action would lead you into a deadly trap. It's possible that a lot of the strychnine had already evaporated or something, and that's why he didn't die. <clears throat> William Shamspear, how does it go? To be or not to be? That is the question. From Shakespeare's Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. Well, let me tell you, in your case, it's not to be. That is the answer. You deserve to die for what you've done. Ah, uh, err. But Olive still hasn't admitted to a thing either, though. No? At first, I really did think it was just a terrible accident. I'll never forget our conversation the night before Duncan died. The gas supply in my loot lodgings are a complete disaster, you know, Olive. The gas supply? Yes, the stove always seems to go out in the middle of the night for some reason. That's no joke. They say it's the convict's curse. Oh, Duncan, please, don't stay there. I don't care how cheap it is. All right, then, if it's, if it's that important to you, I'll start looking for a new place. There are spare rooms at my house. Why don't you leave that horrible room tonight? No, I'd better not. We said we'd wait until we'd graduated before we told our parents, remember? But that was the last time we ever spoke. That very night, he fell victim to the gas. 
If only I'd known it was going to happen, I'd have insisted he left that horrible room that instant. But instead, all I've been left with is bitter regret. I stopped going to school, but something kept drawing me back to the house on Briar Road. I saw a stooped, eastern-looking man with a mustache coming out of the house one day when I was there. He walked up the road to Grub's Grubbery for some food, so I followed him and sat myself down next to him. He had some watery-looking soup and started to pick a quarrel with the publican. That place is cursed, I tell you, cursed! The ghost of that convict we used to live there! He's trying to suffocate me! I wake up in the middle of the night, freezing to death because the stove has gone out. The room is f full of gas and I can hardly breathe. But the pipes have been checked, no problem there. It's like, I'm the problem, that's what they're thinking! But how could that be? Duncan was gone and... Now this man had almost suffered the same fate. Could it really be a curse? And then she heard, like many other people, of the, the, the inquiries about the stolen gas or something. Then I remembered a rumor I had heard about how the gas companies go and what... Sorry, I skipped part of the text there. Around investigating the gas installations. Yeah, there we go. She heard of it. A rumor. Ah, oh, you mean... Yes, everybody's heard the stories, it seems, about how they go around checking the pipes. How anything connected to the gas can be extinguished by blowing hair into the pipework. That's when it started, a little flicker of doubt in the back of my mind that just wouldn't go away. Was it really an accident, though? Once I'd had the idea, it wouldn't leave me alone. It plagued me day and night, so I bought this at one of the black markets in the East End. A black market? I'd never been. I just heard people talk about them, and you really can't buy anything you can think of there. In some ways, being able to get my hands on this so easily made me even more determined. I had to find out, one way or another. Was Duncan's death an accident, or was it murder? Oh, okay, she, maybe she didn't... ...really mean to kill him. But, like... If he's not the killer, he's not gonna die from it. But if he does blow into pipes to try to get other people uh, dead, uh, then he will have to pay. He, he will pay for uh, what he's trying to do. Right? Yeah, I guess so. I guess that makes sense. Was Duncan's death an accident or was it murder? And your chosen method for establishing the truth was simple, but highly effective. It could have been an investigator that that, that put his mouth around the pipe, though. That was kind of risky, that could have... Uh, how should I say that? Reached someone that had nothing to do with the case. Smear poison on the gas pipe you suspected the man of tampering with and wait. If Mr. Shamspear was innocent, nothing would come of what you'd done. But if he was guilty, he would pay for his crimes dearly. Hmm... I found out the name of the man I suspected, William Shamspear. And then I wrote him this little note. I have information regarding the death of Duncan Ross. Come to the slug and salad on Briar Road at 5pm on the 17th. Don't tell anybody else about this letter or the meeting. It is a matter of utmost importance. If he'd done it, I knew that would worry him enough, so so he'd be sure to go. So I waited to see if it worked. And of course, Mr. Shamspear followed the instructions to the letter. I worked out where the gas pipe was straight away, so I smeared a good amount of the poison I'd bought all around the mouth of the pipe. All the time praying that the devil's work wouldn't be done, and that it was all just some wild fantasy. Actually, no. All the time praying that the devil's work would be done, and that the culprit would get its just desserts. Three days ago, when you were first stood in the dock before me, this whole affair seemed relatively straightforward. Yes, my lord. 
I certainly never imagined the depth of depravity that we should subsequently find lurking behind the scenes. It has been a long road, my Nipponese friend. Oh, yes. And one I certainly didn't envisage walking with you. Nevertheless, together we have reached the light at the end of the tunnel, as it were. Miss Green. Yes, my lord. You will henceforth be stripped of your freedom, as punishment for the attempted murder of Mr. William Shamspear. Yes, I know. And you, Mr. Shamspear, you will be tried for the murder of Mr. Duncan Ross in cold blood, and the subsequent attempted murder of Mr. Sosaki Natsume here present. <sighs> Um, Mr. Naruhodo? Ah, uh, yes! Yesterday, at the hospital, when you and your friends stopped me from... from ending your life by drinking what was left in the poison bottle, I, I wasn't myself. I can't even really remember what was going through my mind. To be or not to be, I suppose. That's a question that's so hard to answer, it seems. Well, personally, I'm glad of your being here, Miss Green. And I'd like to believe that it's a blessing Mr. Shamspear didn't die when he ingested the poison. For your sake, at the very least. Because of you, I chose life, not death. And now you've made the truth come out at last. Really, I can't thank you enough. Oh, Miss Green. Mr. Sasaki Natsume. Yes, my lord. The court declares that you are exonerated from all blame in this matter. Accordingly, I would call upon the ladies and gentlemen of the jury to present a verdict of not guilty. We are in full agreement, my lord. In that case, I hereby declare the defendant... Not guilty. Court is adjourned. Yeah, I knew it. Alright. We're done with the second episode. The Old Bailey Defendant Sentry Chamber. Oh. Yes, yes, at last! Divine justice duly done! Divine justice? My dear fellow, if there were any divine justice in this world, you would shave that mustache. <laughs> no! This has nothing to do with my mustache! Some say that the luxuriant mustache is a sign of physical prowess, Mr. Sholmes. Welcome, student Mr. Naruhodo Esquire, once again. Once again, you've saved me from doom! I'm very happy to have been able to help, Mr. Natsume. Congratulations on your acquittal. You're second in almost as many days. I was first acquainted with and gained affection for English literature whilst in our great homeland empire. And then, by a twist of fate, I was brought to the land that bore the fruit of that literature. Only, the city of bricks and mortar became my prison. Try as I might, I never found my feet here. In the end, I confined myself to my room and lived life through friendly old books. You've had such a difficult time, haven't you? Ah, but a week ago now, I dragged you out of that dark and dingy room of yours, did I not? You did, you did, and I've seen more of life in this week than in all my years to date. And for the first time, I feel I've begun to see the true face of the English that's so far been hiding from me behind the wall of fog. My dear fellow, there is nothing special about the true face of the English, as you put it. Wheresoever one goes in the world, humans are human. And there are few genuine differences. Yes, I think you're right. I finally started to see that, and I've come to understand something. I've worked out why I was attracted to English literature in the first place. It made me see that whatever our nationality, we humans all have the same hopes and fears. We're all just doing our best to live. Well said, I've come to feel the same way. I've made a decision too. 
I'm going to cut short my study tour here and return to Japan. What? Just when we'd become friends here in England. What a terrible shame. Oh, I know that dust tug at my heartstrings, it really does, but I've decided I'd like to take everything I've learned here in Britain and write something on my own. A uh, novel of sorts, I suppose. Oh my, so you'll be creating your own literature, Mr. Natsume? How wonderful! Oh, well, no, I mean, I wouldn't presume to call it literature. Why not, when that is precisely the definition, Mr. Mustache? I suppose you're right, yes. It will, in a way, be literature, but as of now, all I know is that I'd like to try my hand at writing. I have no delusions of grandeur. I, for one, would love to read your work. Well, all things considered, it may be for the best. After all, you have once again emerged victorious from a battle with the Reaper. Ah, that's very true. <laughs> And there is no salvation for a person in the dock when the Reaper is the prosecutor. The desire to return post-haste to the perceived safety of your homeland is what I quite understand. My goodness, yes! Faced with such a terrifying prospect. Nobody would consider that cowardly, I'm quite sure. But, but that's... That's not why I'm leaving! I mean it! Objection. And that was the case that we found ourselves embroiled in six months ago now. Soseki-san did indeed return to Japan and submitted a report about both cases to the government. It was on reading that report that Professor Mikotoba was prompted to visit the scholar. And barely any time later, Sato-san was given the news that she must return to Japan as well, on the back of a telegram stating falsely that her father had fallen gravely ill. The only possible explanation that comes to mind is what happened after the trial on the following day. The day that we uncovered the loot hidden by the now deceased, deceased convict in his former lodgings. Sunet's made his room. Oh, well done, Mr. Sholmes. How simply marvelous of you to uncover the secret hiding place in just one day. Wasn't it supposed to take 30 minutes? As I believe I told you, my dear fellows, skin prints are extremely useful in such situations. Wouldn't you agree, Gregson? Gregsy's been happily munching in agreement this whole time, you know, early. Happily? I think perhaps humor humorlessly might be closer to the truth. So it transpires, the man fashioned the hiding place in the ceiling. I was in the ceiling. And what's in it? What exactly is the loot? Let us look then if you're ready. Let's examine the late burglar's hole. What the... What is that? Mm, there's blood on it. Is it a... Belt? A neckband or collar? A collar? It's huge though. And look at all the gemstones set in it. I can see why it was claimed to be worth a thousand pounds. Perhaps it, I could have it as a belt. Oh, have you noticed on the inside there? There are some dark stains. You, you don't think. It could be blood, do you? I mean, there's quite a lot of it. On second thoughts, perhaps I won't have it as a belt. <laughs> then, of course, there's this emblem here. A large letter B. Baskerville? And a small crown. What does it signify, do you think? Oh, I hadn't noticed that. Hmm. I feel as though I've seen that emblem somewhere before, you know? Where could it have been? That's enough of that, I think. What? What's the matter with Mr. Sholmes? All the color has drained from his face. Well, Inspector, I believe you ought to be taking this, haunt you? It could be valuable evidence after all. It must be kept safely under lock and key. Ah, yes. 
Get your grubby hands off that U-Lot and hand it over now. I'd never seen a color that large before, and all those jewels certainly looked to be extremely valuable, but that's not what stood out the most to me. At least, not once I'd noticed it. Those dark marks on the inside of the color. Those stains. Could they really have been... blood? Well, that was a funny case, wasn't it? But it's all buttoned up now. And you look very pleased, Iris. I am, because I was starting to wonder what I could use as the basis of this month's story in the magazine. But this case will be perfect, it's been so fascinating. You're talking about the latest installment of the adventures of Herlock Sholmes, I presume. The mystery of the knife in the mist, and the mustached man and the convict's curse, perhaps. I could make it a two-part story. Oh, I can't wait. Um, a word, please, Iris? Yes, what is it, Early? I'm sorry, but you can't write about this case. It's out of the question. Because it's linked to that other case. What? Why not? It's a great case. Then I shall have to insist that you limit yourself to the first of your two titles. The second must never be written. Is that clear? Yes. It's voice now. All of a sudden, what's going on? なぜあの時ホームズさんが事件の発表を禁じたのか全てが一つにつながるにはもう少し時間が必要だったその事件かのロンドン万博の最中に起こったのだった ホームズさんが… And it's the end of this case, yeah. I figured. The key of knowledge awarded. Episode 4. Uh, no, wait, no, 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 no! No, close it, because it's case three that I have to do. Uh, it, it already scro it, it had automatically scrolled to the next episode, and I skipped one. Trying to scroll myself. Checking for downloadable content? Like what? Oh, maybe the, the thing that I have a... A note for in the... In the box, there's a soundtrack or something that I can download. Um, okay, let's get to the next uh, chapter then. Okay, there we go. Episode three: The Great Departed Soul, the Return of the Great Departed Soul. Nineteenth-century. 大帝とロンドンで開催された万国博覧会を知らぬ者はないだろう。世界の文化、最新の科学技術が 大成功のうちに終わったのだった。しかし、その回帰中に起きたあの大惨事の真相解明の裏側に我が友シャーロックホームズの活躍があったことを知る者は少ない。彼はあの大事故の裏に幾重にも隠された真実を暴き出したのである
And is it still in London? London, Bangkok, Hakuran Kai. Kaijo, Afren Bakari no Hitodakari. Ah, turn on auto play. London, you are Metrashi, Satan no Moto, Joey no Kagakuji Kinga, Okonawareo to stay mass. あるべき二十世紀蒸気機関と電気技術は世界を制する馬車は姿を消し自動車が行き交う海を渡る船は羽を持ち大空を飛ぶ本日は皆様にさらに遠い未来の実験をお目にかけましょう Mm -hmm. The heck, what's that? Jintayo, Kodaina, Denki Energy, the Shunjini Bunkaiste, Betsumo Bashoe, Tenso. So she, Somo Sose Joho, Kesanse, Moto no Sugatani, Gotes, Odoku Beki, Kizut. Guy's gonna die. Koreori, Ishun no Nochi. Kono Shinshua, Odoroku Beki, Kukan no Koeru Tabio Sir. Denki Bunkai Sarita Shinshua, Ano. That didn't go well. Bruno, Bruno, are you listening? Oh, sorry, um, what was that, Iris? Hmm, what's the matter with you? You've been miles away all morning. Didn't you like what I cooked for breakfast? No, no, that's not it at all. Hmm, what were we talking about again? Today's paper, it's full of news about the Great Exhibition again. Ah, yes, the Great Exhibition. I'd like to go sometime. You're really not your usual self today. You seem very down. Don't you agree, Early? Hmm? Did you say something, Iris? Oh gosh, you're even more down. Ah! When did you arrive, Mr. Naruhodo? I've been here for about half an hour already. We had breakfast together. <laughs> Moron. What? Why didn't you mention it before? Sorry. <clears throat> I um thought you might have known I was here, you know, because breakfast. Mm, Iris is quite right. You're clearly lacking in vim, so much so that I didn't notice your presence. Thanks. <laughs> of course I could deduce the reason perfectly well with some simple observations. What? <laughs> Let's see, yes, for example, your tussled hair this morning with all its unruly spikes. 
clearly it can be deduced therefore that um, let me stop you there Mr. Sholmes because I think I can see where this is going my hair always looks like this it always has ever since we first met in fact oh really how interesting it just doesn't look like a haircut as such I suppose <laughs> thanks again it crossed my mind recently that it's been six months now six months since I was forbidden from working in court, so I've been wondering how much longer I'm going to be banned. Oh, well, that would explain why you seem rather glum. Don't you agree, Early? Hmm. Did you say something, Iris? Ah, uh, back to moping. What's wrong with him? What's the matter with Mr. Sholmes today? He seems even more down in the dumps than me. I know, and the great exhibition has opened. You'd think he'd be excited. Oh, why don't we all go see it together? I want to, of course I do, but I can't. Not for the time being. Why not? Why not? Why not? Because I'm a great detective after all. So you're embroiled in some tricky case that you can't be distracted from, is that it? I don't remember hearing that you're working on a case early. I suppose I should try to find out what's going on. Every time I look at that machine, I can't help thinking what a monstrosity it is. What's it called again? The great analytoscope, it can, it can analyze absolutely anything, you know? It does seem incredible, and at the same time, incredibly useless. Ah, but it looks impressive, doesn't it? So that makes it very useful. How does that make it useful? <laughs> because it means you can pawn it for lots of money. The pawnbrokers always make idle remarks like, what an incredible looking machine. Ah, so Early often takes it to the pawn shop when he's a little short. It sounds like this thing pulls its weight around here more than I realized by having its weight pulled around. <laughs> okay. Books, papers, scientific implements, these shelves are stuffed to the gunnels. Miss Susato wouldn't be able to help herself if she were here, she can't stand mess. Susie might not be able to stand mess, but she wouldn't dare touch those shelves. Oh, why not? Because uh, everything's in an intricate balance. Yeah, we've already had this uh, description before, so let's skip it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Sholmes' faithful musical companion. Wasn't this violin made by somebody famous? Yeah, that's the same line of dialogue as before. What would you buy, then? Uh, this is new, I think. I really have no idea. I think I'll have to do it so I can find out. Yeah, the part about not spending it on a violin if he did save up for 100 years, yeah, that was new. I do love a good fire in the colder month. Watching the flames flickering and dancing about is just so very relaxing. Cleaning out the chimney isn't so relaxing, though. No, getting covered in suit isn't my idea of fun. You know, Hurley decided he was going to clean it out himself last year. But you can guess what happened, can't you? He got himself stuck inside the flu. He's a very slim man, I admit, but there are limits to where a fully grown man can fit. Now, every time he dozes off by the fire, he has nightmares about it. Ah yes, the huge metal chest with the lace cloth laid on it being used as a table for tea and coffee. It's very sturdy, that's for sure, and firmly locked shut. The chest contains my father's detailed records of Hurley's many cases. Yes, so I've been led to believe. Though personally, I've never actually seen inside. And that's the way it will stay. Those papers are a secret between Daddy and me. If you go open, opening it uninvited, you might find yourself being bitten. What, is there a beast inside there or something? Ah, all these different pieces of evidence from cases that Mr. Sholmes has solved are very interesting. 
The trouble is, Hurley forgets things so quickly and never remembers why these things are relevant. The other day, for example, he saw the orange pips that were there and decided to plant them in the garden. Pips? Yes, they've all sprouted now. We have five new little plants. Oh, well, I don't know what case they were from, but... If Mr. Sholmes can get oranges to grow outside in England, he should change his profession. I look forward to finding out what aroma your tea will have, Iris, every single day. I think that was this already the, the line of dialogue last time. Ah, well, I infuse a different concoction of herbs from the garden every time, so it's never seen the same twice. When you call it a concoction, it sounds more like a science experiment than something for tea time. Yeah, that, that, that's the same as before. Yeah, that was exactly the, the same line as before. Damn, I wish if you already examined something in a previous case and it's gonna be the same line, then it should it shouldn't not be marked with a tick to tell you that you've already read it before. There are so many different bottles up there on that charming little set of white shelves. Is she gonna warn me not to drink from any of it? To be careful, Runo, you mustn't try the contents of any of those bottles yet. Because Sholmes tried. Yeah. Same line as, as before. Not gonna waste my voice on these. I can type with my eyes shut, you know? I can't believe it. Yeah, that, that also was uh, the same before. might just have fallen asleep on a job, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've already checked that. Okay. Uh, converse... Events six months ago. Half a year ago now, I took on the defense of a young girl in a trial heard at the Old Bailey. What at first, what at first seemed like a simple case of murder that took place at the London Pawn Brokery, turned out to be one part of a much more far-reaching plot that involved the British government. During the course of the trial, it was found that I made an unavoidable, yet at the same time, unforgivable mistake. Words fail me, this situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Norehodo! Yes, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. In the end, I had my right to represent people in court revoked. I was told I had to spend my time in research and study, so that's what I've been doing. You have, haven't you, Runo? Reading all those big fat tomes about British law up in your room and the notes about Sholmes' old cases. Brewing Iris' spe special blends of tea, fetching my daily bread for me. <laughs> You've become something of a man's servant around here. Start on the silverware next, Mr. Naruhodo. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of going to ask the powers that be to reconsider, specifically Lord Strongheart, at the British Supreme Court in Whitehall. Lord Strongheart? Ah, uh, the delightful Lord Chief Justice, not my favorite fellow. He's not mine either, but he's the man I have to talk to. He's the only one who can grant permission for me to start working the working in the courts again. I came to Britain to become the best lawyer I could, and I can't do that just sitting around here. The whole of London has been swept up in this great exhibition, hasn't it? The most advanced science, the most modern technology, the finest works of art and feats of engineering. For the next six months, our capital will be showcasing these things and the world will be watching. Oh, do you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to look down on London from one of those lovely balloons. L look down on... Do, do you mean those things fly? Yes, of course, they fly high in the sky and don't even need wings to do it. All you need is hot air. But how? How does hot air have anything to do with flying? It makes no sense. I can't understand it at all. Science! 
facts are true of a lot of new scientific discoveries. Most people can't understand them at first. But in a hundred years' time, all these things will just be common knowledge. I suppose they might be. Mind you, some of the science being demonstrated seems very questionable. Something went wrong on the open experimentation stage yesterday, apparently. There was a huge explosion, still. I wish I'd seen it, though. I'd love to see how bad some of these scam experiments really are. Says the innocent ten-year-old girl. See here, every page of this paper carries some article or other about the Great exhi Exhibition. But the brighter things shine, the darker the shadows that are cast behind them. Personally, I find myself drawn to the darkness, to the impenetrable. That is my proper atmosphere. The Great Exhibition newspaper has been entered into the court record. Shadows cast behind? Is that a metaphorical way of referring to the back page of the paper? So many glowing reports about the Great Exhibition and everything that's going on there. A lost cat. <clears throat> Other than this rather gloomy looking one, that is. Wait, what? What's the matter, Bruno? Is that Van Zeeks? The Reaper attacked? That That's Lord Van Zeeks! This must be what Mr. Sholmes was talking about. Does he know anymore, I wonder? First test of matter transport device. Every article on the front page is news about the Great Exhibition. Public experiments to demonstrate brand new scientific ideas, cultural exhibits from around the globe. It's also positive and hopeful about the coming century. We must all go to see it properly before too long. Thursday... March... Or is it May? 18... It's not high resolution enough for, for me to be able to make out all the finer details. Are you investigating a particularly tricky case at the moment, Mr. Sholmes? Hmm, you could say that, I suppose. Nothing more to add? That's not like you. What sort of case is it? Shh! Quiet, Mr. Naruhodo. We must not discuss it here. You never know who might be listening. You're acting very strangely early. What do you mean, Iris? Well, usually... The more mysterious and complicated a case is, the better early's mood. Is it really a case that's bothering you? Iris, please, you mustn't exercise your astute powers of observation and deduction on me without invitation. Remember what I always say, put yourself in the shoes of the individual about whom you're making deductions. You say that, do you? You, Mr. Sholmes. <laughs> Never mind, once I've had a cup of tea, I must make my way at once to the crime scene. Ah, uh, that was a deep sigh. <laughs> It says in the paper that Lord Van Deeks was attacked. That's terrible. You know the legend of the Reaper of the Bailey, of course, don't you? Only too well, in fact. Yes, Prosecutor Barak Van Zeeks. They say that if the Reaper is the prosecutor in a case, there is no salvation for whoever is in the dock. Oh, am I finally gonna get a, a different prosecutor in the trial, maybe? If he's the victim. Even if the defendant is found not guilty. Once the Reaper has someone in his sights, one way or another, that person's time left on this earth will be short. London's finest rogues always find ways around the law. They'll stop at nothing to secure an acquittal at trial. Falsifying evidence, paying sham witnesses, threatening jurors, bribing judges. But even such devious tactics as these cannot save them from the hand of the Reaper. As you've experienced yourself, haven't you, Mr. Naruhodo? Yes, I've seen the Reaper's retribution at work. Many of these criminal rogues are reckless and quite unafraid to die. If a leader among them, fr their fraternity, is seen to have been taken by the Reaper, retaliation like this does occur. Really, the capital has never has a never-ending supply of such scoundrels. So, do you mean Lord Van Zeeks has been attacked by like this before? This isn't the first time. He's quite an accomplished combatant, you know. He doesn't take these attacks lying down, although 
It seems that his assailants were armed with guns this time. Oh my goodness, is, is he alright then? Is Lord Van Zeeks hurt? My dear fellow, how on earth would I know? Well, in the article here it says, as to what of Lord Van Zeeks and his condition, all will be revealed in tomorrow's morning edition. Ah, uh, I see. Well, we shall have to be patient then. No, 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 I can't wait until tomorrow. In that case, you shall have to inquire with somebody in the know. But who? Lord Strongheart, perhaps. Well, I must be leaving now. Yes, understood. See you later, Mr. Sholmes. <laughs> ah, you, you really are a shameless liar sometimes, my dear fellow. What? You seek to put me off my guard and follow me, don't you? Well, you would be wasting your time. The thought hadn't crossed my mind, but now I'm wondering where you're going. Ah, 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 ah. But he did say it, no? Well then, see you later indeed. Listen to him. He's still laughing on his way out of the door. Nice hat! Alright then, Runo, let's get going. Oh, um, Iris, what are you wearing? I've got changed to go to the Great Exhibition. You're going to take me. What? But, but I was just about to go to the Supreme Court. Oh, well, that sounds fun too. You're going to take me there then. <laughs> Alright, fine. Just lower that weapon, would you? Of course, and after the Supreme Court, then we'll go to see the Great Exhibition. Well, I can't say that I am not, at the very least, a little bit curious about it. been about six months now since I was since I was last here but some things never change like the sense of foreboding I always seem to feel in this place it doesn't seem to be bothering Iris at all though she's happily reading over there oh I love this place I always find so many interesting books here of course I was forgetting that you've been here before the time we came here six months ago when Tsusato-san was given the news that she was to return to Japan. Ah, I understand you wish to speak with me. Hold on. Because I'm feeling a bit cold now. Oh, Lord Strongheart, I trust you've been keeping well? Let's see, since you arrived and requested an audience, it's been 4 hours, 32 minutes, and 26 seconds. I've kept you waiting a while, my apologies. Oh no, not at all, I like nothing more than standing around staring into space. Good to know. Good to know that doesn't appear to bother him at all. Mailed Strongheart, Lord Chief Justice of London. He's the man who allowed me to start practicing as a defense lawyer when I arrived in Britain as a student. You need only savor the air for a moment in this grand office to understand his preeminent status. As you will be aware, the Great Exhibition of London is now underway at last. We're extremely busy as a result. Policing the grounds, guarding the new technologies, dealing with petty crime. And furthermore, as of next month, we shall open the International Forensic Science Symposium. Oh, I've not heard about that. Investigating authorities from 40 countries around the globe will be taking part, including from your own land. Forensic science is the future. The world must embrace it. As we are the hosting nation, I have much to do. And it is my highest priority. If others must wait for my attention as a result, so be it. Well, it's nice to know where I stand. So, you wish to consult with me? Of course, I can very well imagine what this is about. 
Ah, oh, well, um, thank you for agreeing to this meeting, my lord. I want to be allowed to start working as a defense lawyer again in court. That's what brought me here today. But actually, there's something else playing on my mind as it happens. Bruno, just take a deep breath and come out with it. I've just had a great idea. What is it? We could hide inside these suits of armor and spy on the fob watch on the fob watch master to find out what he's really like. I don't have much interest in what Lord Strongheart is really like, though. <laughs> oh, please, it would be fun. You could be inside the left one and I'll go in the right. You really want to have a go in a suit of armor, don't you? Hmm, now you're making fun of me because I'm a child, aren't you? I wasn't making fun of you at all. I'd like to have a go, too. <laughs> you couldn't read all these books even if you were reincarnated three times over as a bookworm. <laughs> oh, I know. So much reading material. I'm very envious. I've really been running out of things to read recently. That's because you read so fast. Perhaps little by little I could swap some of the books here with some of mine from home. I don't see why not. No one would notice, or at least I wouldn't, even if I was reincarnated three times over as a librarian. The Lord Chief Justice Desk. And when you look at that, there's no mistaking Lord Strongheart's authority, is there? But the light from that window behind is far too bright, it would be very bad for the eyes. I hadn't thought of that. There are no curtains, that's for sure. What's more important, having a desk with an air of authority or having eyes that work? Can't say I'd ever considered it. After all, my little office barely has any light to speak of and I haven't really seen my desk in a while. The clock. The cogs of the giant clock are keeping time as usual with their steady rhythmical motion. It's really quite disturbing how little sound they make, considering their massive size. Someone very brilliant must have designed it, and whoever maintains it must be very talented too. But I'm not entirely convinced it's even a clock. What? But what about the huge clock face that forms the window over there? Some people just make machines that move for the fun of it because they enjoy watching them. Rather like how early makes his rambling deductions just for the fun of it. Even if the outcome isn't quite right, never mind all the trouble it gets others into along the way. Hmm. Okay. We've come this far. I actually came here today to ask for your permission. Go on. Six months ago, my right to work in court as a lawyer was revoked and I was told to spend my time studying. Obviously, I'm very sorry for what happened, but the thing is, it made me understand what it really means to defend somebody under the rules of a foreign justice system. And I desperately want to have another go. Please, permit me to enter the courtroom again. Mr. Naruhodo, yes? Ah, uh, here it comes. I'm sure you haven't forgotten your position here, have you? At best, you are a substitute for your compatriot. This was never your intended role. Well, that's true. The Japanese government actually sent my best friend on this study tour, not me. It should have been Kazma. He was so determined to bring change to our own justice system at home. That was his calling. Garderob. <laughs> if that tragic accident hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here in this office now. Mr. Asogi was my best friend, you see. That's why I can't leave it unfinished. I have to fulfill his calling for him. Hmm, his calling, you say. Has it never occurred to you that perhaps you know nothing of his true calling? Sorry? The mission with which that young law student was charged. What do you suppose it really was? What do you mean? Mission? He's not making any sense. Hmm... Never mind. I've read all the reports you've submitted over the past six months. It's clear to me that you regret your actions and have been studious, studiously obeying your revised instructions. Do, do you mean... 
As of this moment, I reinstate your license to practice law here in Great Britain. Thank you, thank you so much. That's wonderful news, Rudo. In fact, I believe I have the perfect case to mark your comeback, a curious affair. You'll consider it, I hope. Of course, please tell me more. You described it as a curious affair. Yes, that's right. I believe it was reported in the press. Are you aware that there was a serious accident at the Great Exhibition yesterday? Oh, no. Yes, I read about it. A professor from Germany tried to carry out a crazy experiment. Let me see. How was it described? Super high voltage instantaneous kinesis, I think. Kinesis. Instantaneous kinesis? As in moving things with a click of the fingers? That's right, it's just what my herbal blends need. A dash of devil may care. Whatever the serious accident was exactly, it's clearly captured Iris's imagination. It's an unfortunate business. A large explosion engulfed the public experimentation stage and a man lost his life. A certain Mr. Odi Asman, an inventor and a well-known figure in society. A large explosion? A, a man died? The man responsible for the experiment was Professor Hal... Albert Hairbrain. <laughs> he was detained immediately after the incident and is due to appear in court tomorrow. On the charge of murder. What? Murder? If you intend to take on his defense, you should hurry to meet with him at the prison. There is very little time left for you to carry out any kind of investigation. The Great Exhibition, a scientific experiment gone wrong, and... Murder? I feel out of my depth before I've even started, still. We should go to the prison straight away then, and try to meet with this German professor. Don't you think? Definitely. Ah yes, one more thing about the case. There is a connection with our mutual acquaintance, the Reaper. Oh? With Lord Van Zeeks? How? Uh... I've already been through this one. Now I have to skip through everything. That's actually pretty... backwards thinking of the designers of this game in this modern era. To not let you back out of something that you've started reading. That's not modern enough. All sorts of conferences have been taking place around the world to coincide with the Great Exhibition. And next month, the largest and most important of them will t all will take place at last. The International Forensic Science Symposium. It does seem as though criminal investigation needs to embrace scientific methods, doesn't it? Exactly. Ah. London, the global epicenter of culture, science, and wealth, now has a population exceeding 6 million. Sadly, crime in the capital is growing at a similarly startling rate. So it's imperative that we use the latest scientific methods to investigate and resolve cases as efficiently as possible. Which is, which is what's known as forensic science, isn't it? Exactly, the future of policing. Ah. Regrettably, however, Britain is currently dragging its feet when it comes to the adoption of forensic methods. Oh dear, that's alarming. Exactly, it's extremely alarming. Do you have to be so over the top all the time? <laughs> if I were Her Majesty's Attorney General, you can be sure. The numbers of crimes committed and resolved in London would be very different to the current figures. And I can cite 12 solid arguments and 223 individual reasons to support my claim. Sorry? <laughs> By way of apology for keeping you waiting earlier, I shall detail everyone now. What? Oh, how fascinating. It all began 15 years ago. I was...
<laughs> and that more or less sums up my feelings on the matter, in the simplest of terms, of course. Essentially, to formally establish a forensic investigation division with a Scotland Yard. That is my mission. Oh, um, right, yes, that's wonderful. Exactly, wonderful is precisely what it will be. <laughs> Iris isn't paying attention at all. She's got her nose in another book now. Oh, is it over? Did you learn anything useful? I actually drifted off for the most part. He's surprisingly ardent about forensic science. Uh... Oh, that reminds me, have you seen this? The reports of the overwhelming success of the Great Exhibition? Of course. No, no, not that. The story on the back page. What story? The Reaper attacked. Ah, that. You've enjoyed some victories in court against my number one prosecutor, have you not? Poor Mr. Reaper. What happened to him? He, he wasn't killed, was he? There is no need for concern. Lord Van Zeeks would not be so easily dispatched, I assure you. Can you tell us what happened? I'd really love to know. Very well. If it interests you. It does, strangely. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, because initially I was more interested in that, actually. Fortunately, Lord Van Zeeks emerged from the attack unscathed. Street ruffians are no match for that man. He's a very capable fighter. But, but that's incredible. They were armed with guns. Why was he attacked, though? Do we know? It's related to events that occurred a month ago. A leader of one of the capital's criminal organizations was indicted and prosecuted by Van Zeeks. Oh, so you mean he started taking cases where I'm not the... The attorney? But the man was acquitted. I have no doubt large sums of money were involved behind the scenes. Large sums of money? A deplorable situation. Members of the jury were bribed, it seems. However, despite winning his freedom... The man question met a dramatic end yesterday. But, but you're not suggesting that was the work of the Reaper, surely? The victim's henchman certainly seemed to think so. He was a man by the name of Asman, Mr. Odi Asman. Did, did you say Asman? That's the man who died in the big explosion at the Great Exhibition. Yes, known publicly as an investor, but in reality, the head of a significant criminal organization. Unbelievable. I wonder, could I ask you something, Lord Strongheart? Try me. Why do you use Lord Van Zeeks as a prosecutor? All the criminals who manage to get off in court then meet with mysterious ends outside the courtroom. And fearful of that fate, they seek to strike out Lord Van Zeeks first. I know there's no evidence that he actually is the Reaper in that sense, but still, something's clearly going on here. I have Van Zeek's work for the Prosecution Service for two reasons. Firstly, the man is the best prosecutor in the capital, bar none. And secondly, any death of criminals that have occurred outside the courtroom following his trials are nothing to do with him. But that doesn't make sense, how can you explain the way so many have died if not by someone's hand? Van Zeeks may have earned himself the moniker of the Reaper, but he is no killer, so he will continue to prosecute on behalf of the Crown. Unless he wishes otherwise, of course. Well, I must be leaving for my next engagement. I'm already 11 hours and 16 minutes late. My colleagues may be starting to fidget. That's because you launched yourself into that long explanation before. <laughs> There's no other reason for it. Hmm. Yeah, hold on a minute. As I am busy. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
I'm already 11 hours and 16 minutes late. My colleagues may be starting to fidget. Yeah, 11 hours late. That's quite something. That meeting had already started when I arrived back here for this engagement with you. So lateness was inevitable. Time stops for no man. I'm sure it stopped for me during those 12 solid arguments and 223 reasons. Oh yes, where would I find Lord Van Zeeks now? I would assume he's at his office. Right, I'll go and ask him about the attack in person. I want to get this straight from the horse's mouth. Away with you now. I'm leaving, Professor. Hair brains defense ent entirely in your hands. Okay. Uh, of course, yes. Thank you very much, my lord. A new location has been added. Okay, the prison. The prosecutor's office. I'm more curious about Van Zeeks at the moment. This warrants a look around. <laughs> oh, so this is the legendary Reaper's office. Yes, it appears so. Brr, it, it sends a chill down your spine, doesn't it? What an amazingly deathly atmosphere. Oh, is that... That hooded figure was so still I hadn't noticed his or her presence. I wonder who it is. Van Zeeks himself, I would imagine. What are you doing here? Ah! Or not? Is it someone else? <laughs> He's as unwelcoming as I thought he'd be. Actually, maybe even more so. Oh, I, um... I'm glad to see you're well. I am. So, who's the person over by the wall being punished for something or other? No punishment is taking place here. Oh. That's my apprentice, and he's sitting there of his own free will. Ah. I didn't know you had an apprentice. Must be the same person who has pictured in the newspaper. He's very able in combat, a requisite skill for anyone under my tutelage. Are you referring to the attack on the Reaper that was reported in the papers? The Reaper. I'd be interested to know the Reaper's true identity myself. Assuming, that is, such a fabled fiend genuinely inhabits our great courtrooms. You speak of yourself in the third person? That's... weird. <laughs> uh... Lord Van Zeeks' desk. Look, it's so stylish. And that's a marble chess set behind beside it. Chess. That's the western version of our Japanese shogi game, isn't it? You know, I'm actually quite good at shogi problems. Oh, really? You'd probably like chess problems in that case. I'd love to challenge Lord Van Zeek sometime. To a bout of shogi problems. If you only really want to challenge yourself, you can always do that on your own at home. Chalices? <laughs> Look at that fine collection of hallowed chalices and bottles neatly lined up there. <laughs> My hallowed bottles are filled with the essence of the finest grapes from the finest vineyards I visit. And I personally oversee these chalices being made by the finest crystal craftsmen in the world. Eh, well at that time we in Belgium had a... Great, one of the most world-renowned crystal making factories in the world. It still existed when I was little, I visited it. But it's... it's closed now, sadly. I even had a, a little crystal glass with my name engraved in it. But my brother broke it when he was a, a toddler. Sadly, so I don't have it anymore. And now you can't get crystal from that factory anymore. And I personally oversee these chalices being made by the finest crystal craftsmen in the world. And yet you throw them around in court like they were worthless. <laughs> 
Yes, because this imbecile is so unimaginably and repeatedly wide of the mark sometimes. Oh. <laughs> Before you open your mouth next time, you should consider the poor artisans whose work you defile. I'm not the one throwing glasses around. So it's my fault? Silly me, how could I ever thought ever have thought otherwise? Because <laughs> now it's my fault. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, it's a scale model of the Great Exhibition Showground. That's amazing. I wonder why it's here. Perhaps he made it to take his mind off the sadness of being too busy to attend in person. Or perhaps he's too embarrassed to queue up for a ticket. Surely it's obvious that I'm using it as an investigative aid. Ah! You Nipponese have no business painting others as overly reserved. <laughs> Uh, I really didn't think he'd overhear that. <laughs> What's that? It's uh, ah, how'd you call that in English? To make booze. Uh, how'd you call that in English again? I forgot. Alambic. I don't know that that. That would be the same word as in French, if that was the case. A funnel? No, no, no not a funnel. Uh... A still? Is that how you call it? A still? Oh, okay. Oh, well. That's the first... I'm not sure I, uh, I ever heard the word before, but now I learned something. It looks like a still to me. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I meant to say. Uh, that portrait really dominates the room, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a very majestic outfit and pose, but sadly, whoever painted it didn't do a very good job of capturing Lord Van Zeek's, Van Zeek's facial features. Maybe it's not him? Yes, you're right. I mean, it's not far off, but the artist has exaggerated his subject's handsomeness, I think. Ah, that reminds me. I heard Emperor Napoleon of France ordered artists to make him look more attractive when they painted him. How vain. That's really not an attractive quality in a person, is it? The portrait does not depict me. Surely that's immediately obvious. His father? A brother? Then who is it? He's not saying. Oh. Look at all those ancient casks lining the wall there. <laughs> casks in the Reaper's chamber? Or are they caskets? <laughs> you, you don't think. All those p people who escaped c c conviction in court are lying inside them? The dead? Do you? What ridiculous notions are you going th are going through your head, man? <laughs> this is my collection of fine vintages. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Thank you for clearing that up. Runar and I were just musing to ourselves. Don't mind us, Mr. Reaper. I wouldn't if you hadn't invited yourself to my office to talk nonsense within my earshot. He has bats, by the way. Ah! <laughs> They were bats! Yes, the Reaper is familiar, as I expect. But what about the mute man in the dark, in the dark cloak? I thought he was the familiar. It's not the flying kid. That's just not the flying kind, sorry. He must be a dear friend of Mr. Reaper, then. I think the familiar ID is more likely. Scary, though. Either way. <laughs> Hello? He really looks like a punishment to me. I've never seen someone sitting like that before. He hasn't moved a muscle since we arrived. Do you think perhaps he's dead? <laughs> if he was dead, Bruno, he wouldn't be sitting up, would he? Well, anyway, dead or alive, he's not overly approachable, is he? I don't think he's going to talk to us. He's not dead. Hmm. Okay, well, I think we're done looking around. Lord Van Zeeks, about the article in this paper? Ah, uh, yes, it seems there was a reporter nearby when that little skirmish took place. 
Did you take a bullet or not? Like you're completely unhurt? I had no idea I'd been photographed. It was careless of me. It looks as though it was taken after the people who attacked you had run away, though. Rest assured, the police have already apprehended every last one of them. But there's someone else fighting alongside you, it seems. And I think it's the same man who's sitting over there as we speak, isn't it? As I mentioned already, he's my apprentice. Perhaps you could tell us a little more about him? Hmm, okay. That unlocked something. Last night's attack. Lord Strongheart said that the assault last night was some sort of revenge attack. True. Carried out by henchmen of Odi Asman's criminal organization. The investigation meant their arrests were imminent. Presumably some hoped to kill me before that happened. Odi Asman. He's always masqueraded as one of London's most powerful financiers. A global investor. But his enormous wealth came to him by underhand means via his criminal activities. And he used that money to buy himself a verdict of not guilty when he found himself in court, didn't he? Being prosecuted by you, Mr. Reaper. But the man got his comeuppance in the end. Yesterday, in fact, in extraordinary circumstances, it was a most unusual cause of death. I know about that. It was super high voltage instantaneous. Kinesis has gone wrong. Mr. Asman died when the demonstration on the public experimentation stage ended in an enormous explosion. Correct. And you think I have some kind of divine ability to cause an accident like that to happen, do you? Well, no, that does seem a little far-fetched. If this man really is the fabled Reaper, then he has to be innocent of this particular death, at least. It's strange how this has worked out, isn't it, Rudo? I mean, what with you taking on the Professor's defense for the trial tomorrow? What, you're going to be defending him? Oh yes, that's right, though I barely know the man's name yet, to be honest. Albert. Albert Hairbrain. That's right. Do you know him by any chance? Of course. He's a contemporary of mine. We were at university together. You're... what? I understood that Professor Hairbrain was from Germany, though. He came to study in England, perhaps? Ah, no. Hairbrain's from a respectable British family. After graduating from the University of London, he moved to Germany to carry out research, that's all. Ah, okay, so it's the other way around. Okay. So you were students together. I was in the Faculty of Law, of course, and he's in science. And he in science, so our path rarely crossed. But curiously, we got along, though I've not met him since my university days. I certainly didn't expect our next encounter to take this form. And with you of all people representing him, uh, only if I make it out of this office alive. He's actually been charged with murder, it seems. Yes, I know. Because the prosecution will be handled by me. Ah, okay. Well, there goes my hope of facing a different prosecutor for a change. By you? But, but you made it sound as if you and the professor had been friends. We are friends, it's true. Then why would you do this? If the Reaper is the prosecutor, there's nothing anyone can do to save him. He's doomed. <laughs> What's Lord Van Zeek's thinking? What do you mean by what you said before? If you'd like to know the Reaper's true identity, does that mean... I'm a crown prosecutor and a mortal like any other. I'm no demigod. <laughs> but they've all died, haven't they? The people you've prosecuted, I mean. Whether or not the trial ended in a conviction or an acquittal. Those I prosecute are the vilest wretches of our society. People who without question deserve to be found guilty. The world is a better place without them. <laughs> but that's not true of Mr. Natsume, for example. He wasn't a vile wretch at all. <laughs> No, it was Jeannie. In fact, she's ever so hard working now. I can't deny that since I, I can't deny that since I encountered you, things have taken a turn. But the point is this: 
If any of those vile wretches that escaped justice subsequently died in mysterious circumstances, it was at the hand of their own kind. It's not my work. <laughs> Lord Strongheart said the same. He believes you're not involved in any way. But you were attacked by those ruffians because they believed it's true. The fact is, since people started to call me the Reaper of the Bailey, the number of serious crimes in the capital has dropped substantially. Oh, it would appear that even the most hardened criminals can be made fearful for their lives. Do you mean to say... I mean to say that if my pseudonym serves, as a, use serves a useful purpose, I adopt it gladly and with honor. But it's putting you in danger, you could be killed. If that is my fate, let God decide. Lord Van Zeeks. He's in my tutelage to become a prosecutor, so you could say he's my apprentice, I suppose. Ah, like you are too early then, Runo. I don't remember taking an apprenticeship with a great detective. He's currently compiling a report about last night's attack. Attack. It looks like he's wearing some kind of mask. On Lord Strongheart's orders. Nobody knows the man's face, or indeed his identity. But why would you agree to take on such a clearly suspicious individual? Lord Strongheart's orders again. He's not one for meaningless follies. There will be a good reason for his actions. I hope you're right. Kazuma, is that you back from the dead? Ah. Uh, uh, hi. <laughs> The task is complete? Good. In that case, you can collate all the briefs. Nice to meet you. Back to work again. That was really strange, though. I've never met the man before. I didn't even know he existed, and yet... Somehow, it didn't feel like our first encounter. And why not? Kazuma pretending to be dead? Posing as dead so that he could better- so that he could better fulfill his mission? Could it be? And that he purposely planned on having me replacing him? And that's why he invited me on the boat? Could it be? Don't bother trying to converse with him. He says nothing to anybody from outside this office. Lord Strongheart has strictly forbidden it. Oh, I see. Why are you so interested in my apprentice anyway? Mm, oh no, I mean... Sorry, I didn't mean to... The way he stood there so casually, yet with that flawless posture. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. Well, we're done here. Ah yes, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. Oh, what's that? <laughs> that Nipponese man, is he faring well? Sorry? The one arrested twice in succession six months ago. With the stoop, and the mustache, and the jitters. <laughs> ah, Mr. Natsume, you mean? I'm not sure he'd be very pleased to find out you identified him from that list, Rudo. He's fine, thank you. In fact, I received a letter from him by International Post only the other day. I see. Well, I think we can end our discussion there, don't you? There's little time left before tomorrow's trial. I advise you to spend it investigating the case. Yes, thank you for the advice and for the conversation. Can't believe he's asking after suseki san after a Nipponese. I'm not sure whether to feel happy about that or worried. <laughs> I never imagined that Mr. Reaper would be friends with a mad scientist, did you? That's a turn up for the books. A mad scientist. Ah, you mean Professor Hairbrain. Yes, it might be worth quizzing the professor about his relationship with Lord Van Zeeks, I think. Alright, then let's move. Local prison cell 11.
The warden said cell 7. Cell 11. That's this one. Oh, there's someone curled up in a ball in the back corner. Look. What's his name again? Professor Albert Hairbrain, wasn't it? Um, excuse me, Professor Hairbrain. Who are you? I'm Rinosuke Naruhodo. I'm a defense lawyer. A lawyer? Ah, was it something I said? A lawyer, you say? W would you be here uh, about the experiment? Are you going to defend my hypothesis? Your hypothesis? Sorry, I don't... Yesterday's demonstration! That demonstration was... That magnificent demonstration was... It was an out and out success by anyone's calculations. But, but despite that, no one listens, no lawyer believes in the science. When it's explained, they all leave at high velocity. Is it a great success that the guy is dead? Ah. Now's probably not a good time to mention that your Zell made my concentration leave for a while too. Do you say Zell by the way or Zeal? I think it's, it's Zell. Zeal. I know, it's Zeal. Okay. My bad. Because you say Zealous, not Zealous. Do you? Zealous. Yeah, so that doesn't make sense, but okay, fair enough. I'll, uh, take their word for it. Uh... Okay. Converse. Yesterday's demonstration. Um, you mentioned the demonstration yesterday. The papers have called it a spectacular failure. After all, a man died in the explosion, didn't he? Ah! Yes, you could interpret the results that way if you really wanted to. Well, I, I suppose in the strictest sense. The experiment was a failure, but at the same time, it was a great success. You've lost me. I saw it with my own eyes, right there in front of me. Mr. Asman was spontaneously disassembled. Until then, everything was going exactly as my calculations had predicted. At that point, you should have been beamed to the Crystal Tower by instantaneous kinesis. However... The machine exploded and Mr. Asman is in fact perished. Yes, I can't deny that part of the experiment was a failure. So what you're really saying is, the large explosion that killed Mr. Asman was an accident, correct? Hmm... But the bigwigs had you arrested on suspicion of murder. I was responsible for a man's death. That is the immutable truth here. And for that, I wish to be punished. At once. But... Murder? Never in a million years. It was an accident. Simply an accident. I see. Hurley and I were talking this morning, you know. He said the situation would change completely depending on whether it was treated as an accident or murder. How exactly? What if it really was an accident, then the professor's machine would be kept in protective custody. Mm. On what grounds? Oh. I still have tea. Ah yes, it's newly established here in Britain, the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. That one passed me by. But if the case is treated as murder, then they'll say my machine was the murder weapon and they'll be able to pour over it as much as they like. If they examine it in detail, they'll find out how it's made and then they'll be able to copy my idea. My precious hypothesis will be stolen. The machine must be protected from that at all costs. Hmm. 
That's why it's imperative this whole incident is shown to have been an accident in tomorrow's trial. I see now. So in short, there was a terrible accident at the Great Exhibition Showground yesterday. Yes, or rather, no, the devil is in the details. Strictly speaking, there was a terrible explosion. Sounds the same to me. You were demonstrating super high voltage instantaneous kinesis, weren't you? How fascinating. Humans, like all matter, are made up of particles that are held together by, by electrical bonds. Hold on, getting distracted here. So it must be possible using a sufficiently high voltage to break those bonds and beam the particles through space. That's... that's it in a nutshell. That's my idea, you see? That's my amazing hypothesis. Gosh, that's an imaginably high-level science. Oh, but dare to imagine it. Dare to dream of such incredible technology. Just think one moment I could be here in this cell and the next I could be at the Great Exhibition again. Well, yes, that would be incredible. Hmm. And the next, in the mere blink of an eye, I could be at the great Paris Parisian theater, say. The possibilities are endless. The whole of, of our vast planet would be within reach. So no more hiding in wardrobes on rocky seas for 50 days? <laughs> mm, I don't really see it like that. What do you mean, Iris? Well, if you could travel anywhere in the world instantly... The planet would, wouldn't really seem vast anymore, would it? I think it would feel like it had shrunk. My word, that's, that's exactly right. What are the implications? What does this mean? Oops, that's got Professor Bunny Brain really worried by the look of it. Bunny Brain. <laughs> Clearly this is yet another case of just because you can doesn't mean you should, I suppose. The point is my calculations are flawless. The science works, but without a practical demonstration, it means nothing. And that's always the fly in the ointment. Because practical demonstrations cost a lot of money. Money that young scientists like you don't have. That's, that's exactly it, yes. Early is always complaining about it. He says the government should invest more in science. Well, anyway, I bumped into him at the right time. I met the well-known investor, Mr. Asman. The victim who died in yesterday's terrible accident, you mean? Hmm. I understand Lord Van Zeeks is a friend of yours from your university days. Yes, that's right. He was studying law whilst I was studying science. What was he like back then? Hmm, good question. Unassuming, gentlemanly, an all-round nice fellow, really. Are we talking about the same guy? <laughs> Sorry, I think you misheard me. <laughs> I'm talking about the cold-hearted, merciless prosecutor Barak Van Zeeks. What was he like when he was at university? <laughs> Talk about the leading question, Bruno. As I said, an unassuming and extremely pleasant gentleman. After all, he is the little darling of the Z Van Dijk's family, with all its great aristocratic origins. I didn't realize he had quite such noble blood. Little darling? It was a big a bit of a shock when I came back to Britain and learned what he'd become. The Reaper of the Bailey, no less. Yes, that's right. I did hear, though, that there was a very big event in his life that completely changed him after graduation. Really? What sort of event? Ah, I'm so sorry. But I don't know anymore. I wasn't in the country at the time. I was in Germany already. The love of his life was murdered. Or something like that. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Hmm. If he's really heard all about the Reaper, I really don't have the heart to tell him that Lord Van Zeeks will be the prosecutor in court tomorrow. Hmm. The full name of the man who died in yesterday's accident was Mr. Oddy Asman, wasn't it? 
What exactly was your relationship with the man? He first visited me in my laboratory in Germany a year ago now. He said he wanted to invest in my immaculate hypothesis and I thanked my lucky stars. I see, so you hadn't really known each other until then. Money for scientific research, I'm so envious. As far as I was concerned, the man was an angel. Oh, really? Hmm... An archangel, even. He was prepared to fund the practical demonstration of my hypothesis for presentation at the Great Exhibition. And if that went well, I could expect additional financial support for my research from the British government. Mr. Hasman provided me with, my, with money and an exceptional engineer. He produced the machine to my precise specifications. But then your dreams were blown to dust in one enormous explosion. Maybe the guy is not dead. But finance the scientific to fake his own death. So that the blame may fall back onto Van Zeeks. As you can see, I owed everything to Mr. Asman. I would never... Ever have thought of taking the man's life. Well, he seems genuine enough. I don't think he's lying. So, Professor, let me just make absolutely sure I've understood you properly. A huge explosion that occurred yesterday, that was an accident, you're saying. You had no intent to harm the victim, who was in fact the sole investor in your work, is that correct? That's correct, that's two squared is four. I swear it. Yes, it's true that the man perished in the machine of my invention, so I know that I'm far from blameless in all this, but still, I would never use my discoveries, my inventions to take a person's life, not in a centillion years. I'm a man of science, it's all I know, you have to believe me, please. Do you believe me? Do you believe in my hypothesis? Science is the pursuit of truth, you know, I've always believed that, all my life. I'm afraid I don't know much about science or your theories, but I do believe you. And I will fight to prove your innocence with all my might. I'm a man of the law, it's all I know. You have to believe me, please. When I went to live in Germany after I graduated, I learned something very important. Nationality, class, lineage, none of that matters. As long as you try your hardest, you can achieve anything. Thank you for that, Professor. And thank you in advance for defending me tomorrow in court. All right, Runo, it's time. Time to visit the Great Exhibition. Sorry. Well, that's where the incident happened, isn't it? Yes, I suppose that's true. Time to investigate at last. Hmm. The Great Exhibition Grounds, foot of the Crystal tow Tower. Yeah. Ah, the show grounds are a little too big for my liking. We've been walking around in dense crowds for two hours now, and I felt myself swooning three times. There are a lot of people, aren't there? I've almost been trodden on three times, too. Be careful, won't you, Iris? Don't let go of my hand. <laughs> we finally made it through the throngs, though, by the look of it. Here we are underneath the public experimentation stage where the explosion happened yesterday. What's that? I can hear voices from up on the stage. It sounds like an argument. Right, I've had it with you this time. I'm warning you, I'll arrest you in a minute. Oh yeah, go on then, Spectre. Give it a shot. You ain't got no evidence and you know it. <laughs> Wait, I know those voices. You've got a cheeky little mouth on you, young lady, but a night in the cells will teach you some manners. Just try it, I dare ya, if you want that bag of chips rammed down your throat. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! Greg Z, what are you doing up there? <laughs> Ah! Ah! 
It's you! Here, you're here! Here you are! You, here, your ladyship! How are you, your ladyship? I do hope you're well, your ladyship. Does that make her three times a lady? I'm not wet at all, it's far too busy everywhere. I wanted to ride in a balloon, but there was a three-hour queue. Unbelievable, I'll go and have a word for you at once, your ladyship. You'll be flying as high as a kite in no time once I pull some strings for you. Tobias Gregson, an inspector at Scotland Yard, until recently he was suspended from duty, but it would appear he's back in action now. He's actually quite well known appearing as he does in the adventures of Herlock Holmes. And for that reason, he can't say a word wrong to the story's author, Iris. But there are limits, surely, or there should be. Watch it, sunshine! Sorry? <laughs> What gives, then? Don't tell me you're on this case. Yes, I'm acting for the defense. So we're here to investigate. Hmm... Dear me, that's the situation, is it? Is it really that troubling? Tch, a measly five bob. Is that all you got? You're a lawyer, ain't ya? You? you could stand to carry a bit more copper around in your pockets, Mr. Narahodo. <laughs> what? Hey, that's my last bit of spending money, that is! You can have it back, but I'll have to charge you all yeah, for all the, the bother. Three bob. <laughs> You're still stealing? This is Gina Lestrade, a pickpocket or diver born and bred in the East End of London. In the case that led to my own suspension six months ago, this is the young girl I was defending in court. What's your problem, eh, Odo? Diver, pickpocket, what's with all the name calling? You want a bag? You want a bag of chips rammed down your throat and all that? And all do ya? I thought you were proud to be a diver, Gina. You were just arguing with Pro Inspector Gregson about it, weren't you? I assumed you'd be up to your usual tricks here at the showground. That ain't no way to talk to a lady, Odo. Half a year's a long time. People can change. I'm an apprentice now, learning to be a Scotland Yard detective. So you'll have to call me what everyone else does. It's Inspector Lestrade now. In Inspector? That badge is homemade, surely. <laughs> the Inspector part isn't entirely accurate. No one calls her that. For what it's worth, anyway. Investigating is off the cards for all of us. What's that supposed to mean? Right, well, I'll be back up top. You hold the fort down here, alright? Right, sir. <laughs> this this raises a lot of questions. Let me examine the scene first. What's that? Ah, it looks as though somebody dropped something behind a tree just here. Dropped or hid? Uh. What's that? Some kind of crossbow? Is that part of the machine that exploded? Maybe it could have fallen from the platform above in the blast, perhaps? What's going on here? Oh, nothing. I think I'll hang on to this, just in case. The mysterious contraption has been entered into the court record. A very curious device found behind a tree under the experimentation stage at the exhibition grounds, almost as if it had been hidden there deliberately. For some reason, the ground is damaged in this spot. Look, almost as if there was a fire here or something. Yes, if you look closely, there are some scattered ash and burnt embers too. Well, I suppose there was a big explosion just above here. People probably wouldn't bat an eyelid at a small fire like this would have been. Wait, what? Like this would have been, yeah, okay. I'm not sure we English are quite that laid back, Rudo. Oh, look what's this. A ripped piece of cloth. Hmm, it's not like any fabric I've ever seen before. It's very thick and stiff. It looks extremely durable. It's canvas, I think, with some sort of rubber backing. And the edges appear to be a bit charred as well. Maybe that means it had something to do with the explosion? Let's make a note of it while Genie's mid-yawn. A piece of green cloth has been entered into the court record. Is it a piece for a balloon that you can ride in, perhaps? Hmm. 
Oh, you can look up. I've been meaning to ask you for a while now, but what are those funny round blobs floating in the sky? Oh, they're the flying balloons I've been talking about. I want to go up in one so much. I've, I've read about situations like this in an article about strange phenomena. C creatures from outer space coming in round flying objects t to attack Earth. What? I suppose inhabitants of uh, other planets are bound to be interested in the g great exhibition. This is it, Iris. It's happening! It's not. Don't worry. I'll explain it all to you later over a nice cup of tea, Bruno. <laughs> That's where the cove ended up after his instant kinesis, or whatever they call it. Ah, that's Sheena talking. I th there was actually a body, like he actually did rematerialize somewhere else. And yet they're calling the experiment a success. What's the wooden scaffold there for? The coppers, our lads, set that up after the incident happened. To get the body down, I think. Dunno, really. Didn't you help to erect the scaffold, then? Nah, lookout duty is more my thing. Wandering around the exhibition and keeping a lookout for the fun stuff. Mind Gregson doesn't hear you saying that, or he'll give you the boot. <laughs> anyway. It's an... It's incredible though, isn't it? I mean, could the victim really have bridged that gap by some sort of invisible kinesis? Hmm. The Crystal Tower. It's certainly an apt name. It was built to be the focal point of the exhibition and it definitely is being so tall and with all that glass. I have to know now whether it, ex it has ever existed. Or does it still exist? Destroyed in November 1936? Ah, okay. It doesn't seem like it ever resembled that, though. Hold on. Called the Crystal Palace? Apparently. Eighteen fifty one. The exhibition. I thought they said it was the end of the century exhibition. Here. Ah oh, well maybe not everything is uh Accurate to uh, the real world story. Mm. Well, uh, it did not necessarily resemble that, but I guess there was something akin to that that existed at some point. Mm. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I can't imagine a building like this ever being erected in Japan. <laughs> there are lots of exhibits inside the tower as well, apparently. Of course, there's an observation deck, but there's also an art gallery, a zoo, and a museum. But I heard you have to queue for three hours just to get through the doors. Well, at the moment, the shattered glass from the failed experiment may well be the biggest draw. And thanks to that accident, the whole tower is shut. Suddenly, it's not the crystal tower anymore, but the crystal glass shower. 
Apparently everyone's sticking to the skies now to look down on the disaster area from above instead. But there's a three hour queue to go up in the balloon now. Londoners must be very patient people. This platform must have been set up for the experiment, I suppose. It's very high up. About 30 feet above the ground, apparently. That's what a policeman ju I just spoke to said. I don't really understand feet very well. We don't use them in Japan. <coughs> <coughs> oh yes, yeah, sorry, it's about 9 meters. But soon you'll have been in London a year, Runo. It's time you got used to our measurements. That were not to last and be abandoned eventually anyway. <laughs> Yes, well, this thing is so tall, the spectators at the front would just have seen a wall and nothing else. They probably thought they'd secured the best spot to watch from, only to be disappointed. There's a saying in Japan, the darkest spot is right under the lighthouse. I feel like it probably applies here. These stairs obviously lead to the stage above. We should go up there and investigate the exact spot where the experiment was being conducted. I didn't talk to Gina, though. I didn't get to. So that's it, is it? The machine that blew up. Oh, it must have been a magnificent explosion, and I've seen my fair share. You've seen things like this before, you mean? Of course, Hurley is always doing experiments that end in a bang. In fact, in his own words, explosions are the very essence of chemistry. Ah, that might explain the smell of burning that frequently comes wafting up the stairs. <laughs> One time he made something that exploded with such force it took the roof of the building. <laughs> I wish you'd been there to see it, Runo. It's hard to get too excited about that, given that I now live in the roof. <laughs> well, anyway, that's enough about that. It's time to investigate. Ah, uh, look, Inspector Gregson is over there. He seems to be deep in thought about something, whilst tying up the machine carefully. Really? He just looks confused to me. Okay, uh... Oh... Uh Oh no, I wanted to go back to talk to Gina. Oh no, I can't anymore. Ah, uh, bummer. I wanted to catch up with her. What is that gigantic thing over there? It looks like an enormous water wheel. Oh, that's a ferris wheel. There will be people riding inside those little cabins you can see. Why? Well, they rotate nice and slowly, so it's a wonderful way to see the surrounding scenery. Wait, it's turning? But it looks completely still. Yes, that's because it's turning so slowly. One complete revolution takes about half an hour. If you were mad enough to go in one, it would be more fun to whiz around fast, don't you think? Feel as though you might have just intended a new sort of right there, Rudo. <laughs> there are all sorts of strange buildings here in the Great Exhibition grounds, aren't there? I seem to remember something similar being exhibited in Japan one time. Oh, in your country, Rudo? I do wish I could go and see it. I present a particularly steely samurai with a present of one of early stories I'd written especially. And see if I couldn't get early into a jam against some bar... Bartitsu Master Ninjas. Um, you might not find as many of those sorts of people around as you think. Oh, well that's dull. Oh, but I do know a prosecutor with a Chon Mage top knot I could introduce you to. A Chon Mage, really? Do you think I could have my picture taken with him, do you? Assuming he's recovered from the trim Kazuma gave him a year ago, yes. It ripped itself apart magnificently, didn't it? 
magnificently and mercilessly. So someone stands in the middle of the machine to be disassembled and then beamed through the air? Yes, beamed, not blasted. That's the point. Yes, that part's crucial, really. Is something like that even possible, though, Iris? Oh, Runo, I'm just a, sh a child. How should I know? A child when it suits you, you mean. From what I can tell, I think if you were to pull this lever there, le lever there, lever. Stop! Don't touch that! Ha 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 That was practically instantaneous kinesis the way you flew over just now, Gregzy. Please, your ladyship. I didn't mean to startle you, but I can't let you touch anything. So sorry, you can have some of my latest special blends to make up for it. Wonderful. This stuff really is wonderful. It's just like old times, this is. <laughs> We're representing Professor Hare Brain in court tomorrow, Inspector, so we should be allowed to examine the scene. Ah, listen, Sunshine, even if even I'm not allowed to touch anything up here. It's that blasted special dispensation for scientific equipment act to blame. It's driving me potty. Oh yes, that special dispensation. The professor mentioned that too. More red tape's all we need. I don't know what the government thinks it's playing at sometimes. But we're allowed to just look, aren't we? Eh? Surely that's all right, isn't it, Gregzy? Of course, your ladyship. Anything you say, your ladyship. But please don't get your dainty hands dirty, will you? <laughs> don't worry. We wouldn't dream of touching anything, would we, Runo? She really knows how to get what she wants. Considering how badly damaged everything is, Professor Hairbrain was lucky to escape unscathed, I'd say. We should have a good look around the machine while we can, I think. Touch anything and I'll make sure I'll kill you before I get strung up myself, you hear? I won't touch a thing, I promise, so please spare a thought for your digestion. Anyway, do you really think this machine could actually dis disassemble people like the professor claims? He asks, looking totally incredulous. Give it a rest, sunshine. If we were allowed to examine all these bleeding scrap metal, maybe we could answer that question. But we can't, can we? Because of the annoying rules, you mean? Exactly, the annoying, obstructive flaming rules. Oh, look at the base of the machine there. Oh yes, there's a tool of some kind poking through the wire mesh. What's that? It's a screwdriver, I think. Oh, isn't it a lovely one? The handle is in the shape of a capital letter A. It is? Oh yes, you're right. What's the matter with you? Don't touch anything, I said. Touch anything and I'll make sure I kill you before I get strung up myself, I said. Yes, yes, I understand. Sorry, I only touched it a teeny-weeny bit. But Gregzy, I'm very curious about this screwdriver. Really very, very curious. Of course, your ladyship. You're so clever, your ladyship. Fancy spotting something like this. <laughs> But I'm afraid I can't let you have it. But Runo found it first. I assure you I'll investigate it thoroughly. He's gone off with it. <laughs> hmm. That was very mean, I'm afraid. Inspector Gregson is going to make a very clumsy and embarrassing mistake in next month's installment now. <laughs> Poor Gregzy. <laughs> Uh, no, okay, you can't examine that. I already examined that part. Okay, hold on. Yeah, it's that part I wanted to look at. That amazing horn-shaped device is pointing towards the Crystal Tower. I suppose once people are disassembled by the machine, they're shot out of that thing to wherever they're going. 
I don't think it was supposed to shoot anything, Rudo. It was set up to beam people to the Crystal Tower where, they're be where they'd be reconstructed in their original form. But I don't like the look of it. If, it. if it was as amazing as it looks, the accident wouldn't have happened in the first place, of course. I suppose that's true, yes. But nothing ever goes according to plan, does it? So those are people carrying balloons dangling silently in the skies over London. I always thought the day would come when humans would discover how to fly. But I never imagined it would have it would involve them being suspended from colorful floating Tamari handballs. I'm sure it must feel amazing being up there among the clouds. Let's take a ride together, Runo, please. If I'm being perfectly honest, I would like to try it. But without a cast iron guarantee that the thing won't plummet to the ground, I'm too scared. <laughs> Oh, well, in that case, I should tell you what Early said. It's physically impossible for a flying balloon to plummet to the ground as long as it doesn't explode. Yes, call me crazy, but I think that exploding part might play on my mind a little. We really can't go back to, to Gina? That's annoying. It considers that this is where I already where I already am. I simply go back down. No, that's asking that's asking for too much. Using high voltage electricity to somehow disassemble a man's body and then beam him across the crystal tower. It's an extraordinary thing to attempt, especially in public. True, it was by far the most unusual of the experiments planned for the exhibition mind. To be honest, I'm a bit surprised it was allowed. Carrying out something so dangerous with so many spectators present, I mean. The government's doing everything it can to promote new science and technology at the moment. They are more worried about being ahead of the game than the odd spot of public safety infringements. If they can be the first to develop some new technology, it makes Britain more powerful in the future, you see? Yes, I suppose that's true in a way. So the powers that be are placing the heavy emphasis on scientists' rights at the moment. What sort of rights? They're making it so that any theories the brains have remained the brains have remained their legal property as it were, right through developing it into a practical idea, and even going into production. Hmm. Which is the infuriating reason of scuppers aren't allowed to touch this crime scene? Because the new High Felton Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act forbids it. I see now. The only people with permission to investigate here are for some brand new department at the yard. The Forensic Investigation Team, it's called. We've been relegated to keep in guard. The Forensic Investigation Team? Any old fool can see that this heap of scrap metal was a sham to begin with. But just because it says scientific equipment on the paperwork, we can't do a flaming thing with it. Poor Gregzy is very head up, isn't he? Head up? Like heated up? But you say head up? Really? You can say it that way? Angry or agitated. Ah, that's what it means. Ah. Oh, 
Okay. Well, I had never heard that before. Maybe it's not something that's very... Uh, widespread or wi wide... Maybe it's something, it's something that's not widely used to nowadays, is what I should say. Remind me again, what's this new legal act that means we're not allowed to touch the scene here? Are you having me at it, Sunshine? It's the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. Yeah, that's quite a mouthful of a name. <coughs> I think Early mentioned that recently with a real twinkle in his eye, as I remember. I'm sure he did, Your Ladyship. I'm sure he did. Passed especially for this great exhibition it was. All scientists have to do is present their ideas or inventions to some suits in the civil service, and if it gets rubber stamped, that's a guarantee of rights to maintain the invention's confidentiality. What does that really mean? Think about it. Think of all the world-changing new inventions on display every day at this exhibition. Although a good half of them are a load of cobblers, if you ask me, put forward by shammers like yourself. Thanks for that. <laughs> oh, I love how absurd some of the, the inventions here are. It's all so fun. It might be fun to you, but a member of the force has to be present at every single demonstration. Can you imagine a... Hank science, that's what I say. <laughs> Oh, I don't think so. That sounds like my dream job. <laughs> You'd soon think otherwise after spending a day guarding all these shammers' bogus contraptions. But if they're all bogus, how can anyone hope to demonstrate them? There'd be no point. Yeah, well... There is a point, sadly. Sorry? Thanks to another of our government's bright ideas, if any theory or invention is deemed to show potential, the government hands out a research grant. A scientist get funding? Exactly, and that's what they're all after. All these shammers coming from far and wide to clog up Hyde Park. And who has to keep them all safe, eh? Who has to smile politely and welcome them? Us coppers, that's who. So you can see why I say it now, can't you? Hang science, hang it. Oh, maybe I can see your point. Apparently, Professor Hairbrain lives and works in Germany now, conducting his research. That's right, came back to Britain especially for the Great Exhibition, as I understand it. Probably after one of the government's research grants. Hmm. Actually, we learned something else about the Professor earlier today. About his time in further education, it turns out he was at university with someone we both know. Lord Van Zeeks. Eh, what's that? That's news to me. But, but if Van Zeeks mans the prosecution, then as the accused, the Professor's fate is... Sealed, because the Reaper will get him one way or another. Blimey, that meant beyond me. I don't know what goes on in that head of his. Talking of Van Zeeks, this morning's paper ran the story of him being attacked, read that? Oh yes, but Mr. Reaper is completely fine, nothing to worry about. Yes, right, glad to hear it. Still, the Reaper, huh? How long is that business gonna keep up, I wonder? I want to try something. If I move somewhere else before I'm done talking... And then I go back... Will I be downstairs? Ah! Okay. That's what I was hoping for. It was eight months ago now that I first encountered Gina in connection with a case I was working on. At the time, she was living in the East End with a group of other orphans. She helped all of them survive by pickpocketing, but then she got embroiled in a murder. I had a lot of time to think in prison. I realized I couldn't go on like I was. The dive-in weren't working out. <sighs> oh, I'm so pleased to hear it, Ginny. Well done. So, you went from being a pickpocket to a detective? You got it. Good, in it. Inspector Lestrade. Sounds like something out of a book, eh? Talk about a sea change. And then there's Iris's old man to think about. Iris's father, you mean? Yeah, I promised her, didn't I? I said I'd get all the police forces around the world to pull out all the stops looking for him. Just a small promise, then. Nothing serious. <laughs> oh, Genie, you're so sweet. So anyway, that's how come I had a go at the test of Scott for Scotland Yard. Only trouble is, I don't read so well, do I? Just a small problem. Nothing serious. And that's when Early approached Gregzy and asked for help. 
So the inspector said he'd take full responsibility for GD and made her a sort of apprentice. That was very magnanimous of Inspector Gregson and Brave. By the way, wasn't he in trouble? For, uh... He was supposed to protect the state secrets or something like that? No? Well, you know, early, he enjoys finding ways to make people do what he wants. The great detective likes digging for dirt, in other words. So, the long and the short of it is, if you've got questions about the case, you can ask Inspector Lestrade. Right then, Inspector. Actually, there's still a big mystery surrounding Gina, isn't there? Oh, what, Runo? What? Well, six months ago, Gina was a defendant in a trial prosecuted by the Reaper. A trial in which she was found not guilty, and yet here she is still. Come on, you're not still on about that, are ya? The Legend of the Reaper, or whatever it's called. Cory, you don't half worry, Odo. If I didn't half worry, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of you left. <laughs> it's like I told you before, in it. The Reaper is kinda like him upstairs, so he knows what I'm like on the inside. That I ain't really done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong might be stretching a point. What about Mr. Natsume in Japan? He's perfectly fine, isn't he? Well, that's true. Perhaps the Reaper is more discerning than I thought. Exactly, so I ain't worried. I'm totally fine. <laughs> Core, it was out of this world, it was. The brainy bloke pulled a bunch of levers on this machine and suddenly it started billowing smoke. Then it just went pop. I ain't seen a better experiment here yet. Sorry? You mean... You saw it, Genie, with your own eyes? Yeah, of course, the boss is in charge here, ain't he? Of keeping everything running smooth, I mean. The boss being Inspector Gregson, I suppose. That's going to take some getting used to. So all I have to say is that I'm on duty and I can do whatever I want to. Get this, I was up in one of them flying balloons when it, ha balloons when it happened, watching it from above. No, you're so lucky, Genie. Maybe I should join Scotland Yard too. Yeah, do it. You know how to put the boss in his place already, right, Iris? You'd have no trouble at all. That's part of the qualifications required, I guess. <laughs> then it's settled. When do I start? No, 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 you can't just join Scotland Yard, Iris. We'll see. Anyway, I, what I don't understand is this. If the machine exploded so spectacularly, how can Professor Bunny Brain still be claiming that his experiment was a success? But even if the guy died, I guess he was indeed beamed across to the Crystal Tower and reconstructed on the other side, I guess, by his machine. Alright, what it was a success in a way. It was? How can it have been? Surely after the whole machine blew up, no one could call the experiment a success. It's like I said, it did sort of work. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of smoke and that whopping great bang. But where do you think they found the victim's body, eh? In the Crystal Tower over there. Or maybe he was just... Blasted off towards the Crystal Tower, I don't know. Did someone saw him fly? Why right in the tower? <laughs> you can see for yourself, can't you? Up there above the scaffold. Oh, where all the glass is broken, you mean? Yeah, the cage what the victim got in to start with. Really did, did get beamed through the air or whatever and landed all the way over there. <laughs> so, you see, it did kind of work, didn't it? What? I I don't believe it. I mean, I don't get the ins and outs of it, but anything's possible, right? With science. <laughs> oh, I tell you what. You can have this. It's a plan of the experiment they drew up at the yard. Are you sure? Yeah, go on. I had three bob of you of you before, so that so fair is fair. Yes, I didn't actually give that to you, did I? The sketch of the experiment has been entered into the court record. A diagram showing the relative positions of the crystal tower and Professor Airbrain's machine that exploded. Hmm. About the investigation. Something that Inspector Gregson said before seemed a little strange. For what it's worth anyway. Investigating is of the cards for all of us. Yes, naughty old Gregzy ran off after that without explaining himself. Oh, right, that. The boss said no one's allowed to investigate that weird machine what blew up yesterday. 
Well, that's not fair. We're representing the defendant. In that case, could you at least tell us what you've learned from your investigations? Nah, you're not getting it. We ain't allowed to investigate neither. Why? What did the boss call him again? The forensic investigation team, I think? Anyway, apart from them lot, no one's allowed to lay a finger on the scene. Bit funny, innit? So even Scotland Yard's own detectives can't investigate? Yes, I've never heard something like that before. Thought I could have a gander on the quiet, though, but the boss caught me at it. You probably heard him giving me an earful about it before from down here, didn't ya? <laughs> it's not bleeding fair. I think you were giving him as much of an earful back as I remember it. Yeah, well, sometimes I think it's all them chips what make him so stubborn. <laughs> you say something to him, Odo. Go on, see if you can get through to him. <laughs> He's up on the platform above us, is he? Where the machine that exploded is. We can try, can't we, Bruno? Gregzy will, will listen to us. Well, I've just been there. It's just I hadn't talked to Gina, so I had to come back down. Okay. Well, I'm glad that I was able to go back to this location and finish speaking with her before... But I, I guess if you needed the the diagram for the court record, then you wouldn't have been able to move on to the next part of the of the episode without talking to her first. The experiment sketch, yeah. Hmm. It looks like layers of thick canvas with a thick rubber lining of sorts. I've never seen anything like it before, but applying Mr. Sholmes' methods, you might deduce it was part of a raincoat worn by someone who really, really didn't want to get wet. And the charring must have occurred when the person was struck by lightning. Or maybe not. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I haven't really looked at it in 3D yet, this thing. There's a crank on it. I don't know, it kind of looks like a... Like a crossbow to me. Sort of. Is there really nothing about it that I can look at? Ah, this? Ah, there's some sort of lever here. It is a crossbow! What the? What is this? It, it looks like a cross between a bow and a gun. I think it's probably used for the same thing, too. A weapon found it hidden behind a tree under the experimentation stage of the exhibition grounds. It turns out it's, that it's a folding crossbow. It half seems like from the piece of canvas and rubber that we found on the crossbow that someone blew up one of the balloons in the sky. Looks like you wind this around in order to draw the bowstring back and create tension. You must be able to fire arrows with a huge amount of force using this device then. In fact, I would imagine it's far more accurate and powerful than a Japanese longbow. Ugh, I really had no idea what, was, what I was picking up when I spotted this at the exhibition grounds. Hmm. Hmm. This groove here must be where the arrows are loaded, I suppose. You say bolts when it's on a crossbow. So I was right, it's a sort of bow with an automatic firing mechanism. This would be perfect for someone like me who catches his ear with the bowstring two times out of three. In fact, if I'd had one of these, maybe I could have beaten Kazuma in Kyudo archery training. Alright, well, I think that's everything for now. Um. Okay, to move to the other section, you do this. And now I can finish talking to Grigzy. Since I wasn't done. The victim of this case, the investor, Mr. Asman. He was another of the Reaper's victims, or so I heard. Lord Barrack Van Zeeks is a top-class prosecutor, but even he can't always push the right verdict through. Sometimes justice can't win. Yes, I've heard about jurors being bribed and evidence being falsified. And that's how the notion of the Reaper of the Old Bailey came about, isn't it? Obviously, Scotland Yard suspected Van Zeeks initially. We all assumed he was taking matters into his own hands if he failed to seal the deal in court. Although the man himself denies that charge. Well, we've done a very thorough investigation and the conclusion we reached... 
is that Lord Van Zeeks is in no way related to the death of those people outside the courtroom. There is no question in my mind. I'd stake my reputation on it, I would. But if that's true, then how do you explain it? All those defendants couldn't just have coincidentally died if nobody killed them. I know that! But, I can't explain it. It's a mystery after all, isn't it? That's the whole point of the Reaper. Professor Airbrain mentioned something else. He said that at university, Lord Van Zeeks was a totally different person, easygoing and kind. You what? He said that it was after they both graduated that something happened to change the man. Do you have any idea what it was? No clue. Really? Look, I've got my hands full watching over this frustrating crime scene. Why don't you go and make a nuisance of yourself elsewhere, eh? Right, are you done here, Mr. Naruhodo? Sorry? Isn't it about time you were leaving? Or rather... It is about time you were leaving. That lot are here now. The forensic team? That lot. The forensic investigation team, yeah, okay. They'll be giving me the heave-ho in a minute, too. Oh dear, poor Grigsy. Here, have another cup of my special blend to cheer you up. Ah, that hit the spot. Yup, hits it every time. Well, at least I've seen the scene with my own eyes. It looks like this is as far as we're going to get with our investigations here, at least. I've been thinking... Hurley might know something, mightn't he? <laughs> About what? About Mr. Reaper! About what happened to Lord Van Zeeks, you mean? Because it sounds like something very significant occurred after he graduated from university. Something that completely changed his life. Maybe, but I have no idea where to find Mr. Sholmes at the moment. He's in the middle of some big case, isn't he? Madame Taspels? Here, this is what you need. What's this? Some kind of entrance ticket? Madame Taspels. Is this supposed to mean something to me? You don't know it? It's the most popular attraction in London at the moment. It's very close to Baker Street, actually. We could go now if you like. No, no, we don't have time for visiting attractions today, Iris. We have a big trial tomorrow. But that's where Early is. What? A at this popular London attraction? He said he was inspecting a crime scene. How is it that you know where he is? Hurley told me, but he told me to keep it a secret from you, Bruno. Madame Tuspels. I don't see how it could be related to the case we're investigating here, but then... Stranger things have happened. And when they happen, Mr. Sholmes is usually at the heart of them. Hmm... Okay then. Madame Tuspels. A museum of interesting waxwork exhibits. Ah, Madame Tussauds! Yeah, that's... well, that's what it's inspired by, anyway, uh, I mean... It's, uh, that's what it, it, it is It is inspired from, I mean, I should say. Or whatever, anyway, you, you get the meaning. This is where Early is, I'd love to know what he's up to, wouldn't you? A museum, of, a museum of interesting waxwork exhibits not far from Baker Street. It's become a very popular London attraction in recent years. Okay. Madame Tuspel's Museum of Waxworks. Okay. What is this place? Look at all these t terrifying scenes, but why are all the people so still? Guillotines, ruthless murderers, I know what I'll be dreaming about tonight. Please do not touch the statues. Statues available, please inquire. Some of them don't even look like statues. It is Sholmes back there in the disguise, isn't it? In the hat. Or, or he's one of the two, anyway. They look alive, those on the right. Maybe the one sitting down is uh, Sholmes. I think the, the hair color matches more uh, his hair color. Anyway, uh, they're all wax models. They're amazingly realistic, aren't they? What do you think, Bruno? Shocked? <laughs> Wax models? Ah! I, I read about dead bodies and wax ones in a magazine about strange phenomena. 
depending on how corpses are kept after death, parts of them can turn to wax, apparently. It's called, uh, Adi... Adi... Adipasir. <laughs> Stop talking about creepy things like that, Runo. You're scaring me. Anyway, Adipasir doesn't form readily, you know? It's only in very specific... Ah! What now? I've, I've just remembered something else I read. In another m magazine about strange phenomena. There was an old lady, maybe a witch, who used to pour molten wax over corpses and put them on display. None of the exhibits in here are real. Except Sholmes. <laughs> yeah, these look reasonably 2D to make me think that they're not real, but those that I saw before looked like 3D models. They had this uh, pixelated outline to them. They're all entirely man-made replicas. They can't be. Do you really expect me to believe that? Just look at them. Oh. There's no way anybody could make models of people that are this realistic. Oh, wait, but no, it... If that was not Sholmes, then... <laughs> wait, what? And they're all such gruesome scenes. Wait. What is it? Oh, no. I must be seeing things. Okay, hold on. The heck? These models are so well made, I can't tell what's waxwork and what's real human. Or maybe... All the exhibits are real people, and when it's closing time and all the visitors have gone home, they suddenly start moving about. Ugh, just... Thinking about it makes me wish I was it was closing time already and I was on my way home. <laughs> These two look real. It's it's the great detective, Mr. Herlock Sholmes. Mr. Sholmes has his own wax statue in here, really? No, not really. <laughs> what well, he is world famous after all. It's an uncanny resemblance, isn't it? It makes my skin crawl to look at it. I know. But look, Runo, you can kick this early and he doesn't move a muscle. You can't go around kicking the exhibits, Iris. <laughs> Wait. It, it just moved, I'm sure. And not just a little bit either. Um, really, did it? And look closely. There are beads of sweat on the face of this waxwork model. Iris, that hurts. <laughs> Shall we move on, Iris? Over there, look, there's a great murder scene to enjoy. Much more appealing. Mata. Mata. <laughs> My dear fellow, I take exception to your recoiling in such a manner as if you've seen something truly abhorrent. <laughs> Mr. Sholmes, I knew it. Iris, what possessed you? I strictly forbade you from divulging my temporary waxwork secret to Mr. Naruhodo. Temporary waxwork? What do you mean? And that kick? Could you not have exercised a little more restraint? You winded me! But Runo has something he needs to ask you. Ah, a question? <laughs> and I thought you'd probably get, be getting bored too. So here we are. Hmm... Well, I can't deny that your timing was impeccable. A mere two minutes more being stationary like that, and my great brain, upon which all my success has been built, would have turned to wax. Thank goodness we arrived in time. Indeed, in many ways, the pair of you just saved the world from an unimaginable unim loss. Oh, Early, do you, li you do like to talk nonsense, don't you? <laughs> you could know something, it's true. About Lord Van Zeeks and what happened in the past to change him. Now that you're here, let's take our time. How can I be of assistance? For you're in luck. I'm suddenly quite taken with the idea of conversing. Oh, well, actually, I'm in quite a hurry. And if my eyes don't deceive me, I believe something is afoot within the walls of this very museum. A most fascinating case, if I'm not mistaken. Really? Moreover, 
I have a strong suspicion that it is related to the matter about which you've come to me now. But, how could it be? We shall speak again presently, my dear fellow. But for now, I must return to my work. What? Back to being the temporary waxwork exhibit? <laughs> okay, I can still talk to him, but before we do that, let's examine everything. Ugh, is this an example of Western Tujigiri? I don't know what that is. You know, when an unscrupulous samurai randomly attacks a passersby to test a sword? I still don't know, no. But actually, a waxwork samurai would probably be hugely popular. Could you model it, do you think, Bruno? Doing that Tsujigiri thing you mentioned? Well, I do have a sword, but I have no intention of testing how sharp it is on a human subject, for now at least. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a funny place for a little ladder. What is it? Is something wrong? No, it's just that in Japanese, we have a totally different word for a ladder that folds in half like that. We do in English too, you know, it's a step ladder, or just steps. So be careful of making assumptions about other cultures, Runo, that's how wars are started. I didn't realize step ladders were an international point of contention, but the writer makes an astute point. <laughs> Okay, let's have a look to the left. Is is this some inf infamous murderer? Yes, called Jane the Ripper. All our all our victims were young women. I knew it. You can't tell by the way she's holding that knife. Sure sign of a murderer. Well, yes. Ah, what's the matter, Rudo? I've worked it out. I know what she's doing. She's trying to fill that bathtub with blood so she can have a soak in her victim's gore. Um, not according to the information about the exhibit on the little board here. It doesn't mention anything about the bathtub. Really? Sorry, I don't think it's significant. Still think it has to be there for a reason. Hmm... That big heavy curtain is in a very prominent position, isn't it? I have a nasty feeling there's going to be something truly terrifying behind it. Oh yes, that's the famous Tuspel special exhibit. It depicts one of England's most notorious killers. Do you want to pay the extra fee and have a look? Pay more money to be even more terrified? Oh, let me think about that for a moment. <laughs> it was only a suggestion. Hmm... These models are so well made, I can't tell what's waxwork and what's real human. That's how Hurley gets away with making himself a temporary exhibit for today. Maybe there are other people posing as exhibits in here then. Or maybe all the exhibits are real people, and when it's closing time and all the visitors have gone home, they suddenly start moving about. Yeah, okay, that was mostly the same description as before, but with the added note of Hurley doing the same. Is this an arm? It looks like an arm, doesn't it? Maybe one of the waxwork models has fallen over? Y you don't think it could be the work of one of the mass murderers in here, do you? Bruno, stop scaring me! Is it a wax arm or a real one? Come on, you're always pointing that finger of yours in court. Poke that arm now and see how it feels. Objection! <laughs> Okay, as for examining the scene, I think I'm done. Okay, let's go back to uh, this dude. Madame Tuspels. What is this place? 
Madame Tespels came to London from France three years ago, I understand. She, since she opened this little waxwork museum last year, it's enjoyed great popularity in London. There are museums like this in Japan too, but these displays are something else. I mean, they aren't made from actual real people, are they? The extreme realism of these waxwork models is a particular secret of the Tespels family, they say. They earned renown during the French Revolution for waxworks of victims of the guillotine. Ugh, that sounds grim. The gruesome scenes were portrayed with such realism and the expressions of the faces of the condemned. Apparently, the sculptors would make the models directly from the corpses, right there at the site of the executions. At the... that really turns my stomach. That's just one of several legends about the Tuspels family. Whether there is any truth in it, I couldn't say. But anyway, this museum ho houses models of famous people from all over the globe. Nevertheless, the most popular area of the museum, by quite some margin, is this House of Horrors. House of Horrors? Of course, visitor numbers are dwindling now as a result of the Great Exhibition, but people usually flock here to see the exhibits of some of London's most vile criminals at their gruesome work. Naturally, most of the miscreants portrayed here were sent to the gallows, so they're even stiffer now than the models of them. <laughs> Have you heard of poor taste? My dear fellow, the public live for poor taste. They yearn to be shocked. So, the hideous exhibits in here are... They're all portrayals of real events that actually took place. Is it just me, or did the temperature in here just seem to drop? Anyway, I advise you not to think too deeply about what you see here. Oh, he's back to being a waxwork, is he? What do you mean by a temporary waxwork, Mr. Sh Mr. Sholmes? Exactly what you see. I'm part of the exhibits here, catching these criminals in the act. Catching them? Every half an hour, I'm, I home in on a different killer in one of the displays and adopt a new pose to ensnare him. When members of the public come for a closer look, I offer them my hand to shake. For a shilling, I'll happily allow them to take a photograph with us. Us? Does he mean him and the waxwork murderers in here? But why, Mr. Sholmes? My dear fellow, isn't it obvious? For the money! He really warred at me there. Very fitting for the House of Horrors. As it stands, I may struggle to pay this month's rent, and I have the ravenous iris to consider. <laughs> oh, early. I'm so hungry. If push comes to shove, I shall have to ask you to do your bit, Mr. Naruhodo. What's the... Th was he, what's he threatening to rope me into now? <laughs> so, with that in mind, how about a photograph? As a special treat, you may have your pick of the murderers and scoundrels in here. The choice is yours. Maybe some other time. Hmm. Remember, Mr. Naruhodo, ignore me at your peril. <laughs> Back to being waxwork again. Is it just me, or did his final remark dare sound a lot like a curse? Well, what is it you'd like to ask me, then? Um, actually, it's... it's about Lord Van Zeeks. Ah, our friend, Mr. Reaper. How did you find him? Well, I trust... And so I filled Mr. Sholmes in about everything I'd learned. About Lord Van Zeeks, about Professor Harebrain, and about the strange coincidence that they had been at university together. So I'm wondering what it was that happened to make Lord Van Zeeks such a different person. I was sure that you'd know early. You said there was something going on here in this exhibit hall before, that something was afoot, and that you believed it was related to what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, Mr. Sholmes, he suddenly climbed up. Well, it seems we've reached the unavoidable. Greetings. The heck? Uh, uh, hello? Where did she appear from? And what's she wearing? Could she look any more mysterious? I hope you are appreciating my museum. Sorry, have we... Mr. Sholmes, do you know this? 
Not again. My apologies. I am Esmeralda Tuspel. This is my museum of waxwork. What? You... You're the Madame Tuspels? Bien sûr, though only 26 years young, I might add. Is that significant somehow? I'm a madam in name only. It has a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> right. Firstly, I must apologize for my waxworks, or rather one waxwork in particular. That'll be Mr. Sholmes, then. I was led to believe he was a great detective, but he seems unable to settle. <laughs> Next time you move from your designated exhibit, there will be toil and trouble. <laughs> she sounds deadly serious. That's a problem. How am I supposed to ask Mr. Sholmes about Lord Van Zeeks now? Let's not forget what Hurley said before about something being afoot. Right here in the museum, I mean. Yes, I know, but... I'm so curious, I want to know what's happening here. Haven't we got enough on our plate already? Did you make all these waxworks, Madame Taspels? I did. I am the third generation of waxwork artisans, you know? Gosh! It was my grandmother who began the tradition in my family. Her fortunes were checkered, living through the turbulent times of the French Revolution as she did. Though that is when she acquired the savoir-faire that, lets, that leads to the astonishing lifelikeness. Is she supposed to have a French accent, or...? All these waxworks really do look as though they're alive. In fact, they look more alive than early. Hehe. <laughs> What you see exhibited here represents the most atrocious of London's criminal past. All the waxworks were created in the presence of the real people on which they are modeled. In the hours immediately following their executions. That is the secret to the extraordinary lifelikeness. It sounds... terrifying. All walks of life have similar challenges, I'm sure. To carry out one's trait par excellence, one must go to extraordinary length. My exhibits are a reflection of society. I create only that which the public wishes to see. Uh, why couldn't the public have wished for something less horrifying? Do not fear. Sorry. This room is the only one in the museum with such mac a macabre theme. I do hope you'll explore. There are models of famous singers, actors, politicians. Something for every taste, I hope. It was Iris who dragged me straight in here, come to think of it. Sorry, perhaps I should have eased you into things. Um, what's the situation with... that? <laughs> ah, my temporary waxwork model? He approached me some days ago, you see, with a business proposal. Oh, what sort of proposal? My dear madam, what these Paris exhibits need is the addition of a world-famous great detective. Or words to that effect. Ah. Naturally, I am well aware that Mr. Sholmes is widely known in London as a talented detective. It's great detective, actually. He's very specific about it. He is the creme de la creme, so I was keen to come to some arrangement with him, of course. But sadly, we were unable to agree terms. Let me guess, someone wanted to charge an exorbitant price for his services? For a mere 500 pounds, I will dive into your cauldron of wax this very moment. <laughs> All words to that effect. Mr. Sholmes might have overdone it slightly with the sales pitch. Regrettably, the museum has a shortage of funds at the moment due to unforeseen circumstances. So we came to the current arrangement instead. Surely it doesn't really need to do what he's doing though, does he? I would think not, but he was very insistent. I have a 50 shilling problem that must be resolved by the morning. How or words to that effect. It's the pawnbroker, that's what it is. He must have something to redeem. 
Is the consulting detective work not going so well? Something afoot. Um, I wonder, could I ask you something? Bien sûr. I'm just curious, is anything going on in the museum at the moment? Some kind of incident, perhaps? Whoever suggested such a thing to you? Uh, well, it was... Your temporary wax work over there who mentioned it to me a little... Oh, it's disappeared. A wax model is a work of art, not some tawdry object for trade. Ah! There you are! <laughs> Leaving the exhibit again when you should be working? Do you wish to be melted down? My dear Madame Tuspels, save your reprimands. There are more pressing concerns. The wax can wait. It's our ideas about, our, about your current problem we must throw into the melting pot instead. Personally, I would advise you not to involve the police. Why ever not? She's turned as white as a sheet. Because you have at your disposal a great detective whose services you may employ for a mere 50 shillings. Though please be aware that I prefer... No, I insist upon payment in advance. Very well. Let us see if the great detective is able to live up to his name, shall we? Before I engage my analytical processes, I must ask you to clarify something. What prey is behind the curtain? That is the Tuspel's special exhibit. There is an extra charge to see it. Ah, the special exhibit in the House of Horrors. It must depict the special killer then, I presume. Would you be so kind as to draw back the curtain, I wonder? Ah, uh, absolute, absolument non! <laughs> That's incorrect in French. We would say absolument pas, not non. <laughs> non, and non is no. Not is pas. P.S. There is nothing amiss behind there. Nothing amiss, madam. What about the arm protruding ominously from under the curtain? Ah! I strongly encourage you to allow me to see what lies beyond before the situation worsens. Yes, very well. I will draw back the curtains, but only a soupçon. A tiny little bit. I must confess, I peeked behind the curtain earlier. The Tuspel's special exhibit is a very bleak graveyard scene indeed. And yet, somewhat surprisingly, the waxwork killer one would expect is nowhere to be seen. What does strike one, however? We've seen him before, haven't we? He was a juror in a previous case. Is the portly gentleman lying peacefully on his back on the floor? Wasn't he a juror? Well, well then, perhaps Mr. Sholmes... That man on the floor is the ruthless killer himself? I'm afraid not, my dear fellow. He's a perfectly ordinary L London gentleman. Not even a waxwork, in fact. What? As skillfully, made, as skillfully made as these waxworks are, they are always distinguishable from real humans. So allow me to present my two conclusions. The first... is that a sizable business transaction has been taking place in this special exhibit. Why? Why would you say that? And the second is that the aforementioned transaction is linked to a serious crime. Ah! She looks as pale as candle wax. I don't understand. And my throat is starting to get sore. So, Madame Tuspels, as you've agreed to, to my fee, you shall now have the pleasure of seeing this famously great detective and temporary exhibit at work. The game is afoot. To begin with, we must ask ourselves what exactly is afoot here in this museum. 
The answer is revealed by the bundle of banknotes protruding so helpfully from your bag. Are they banknotes? In my estimation, some 200 pounds. That, that is all my own money. So what does this large sum of money reveal? Ah, not as much as the involuntary glance you cast, it would seem, Madame Taspels. Yes, the answer lies where your eyes now fall. The significance of the 200 pounds is revealed by that public notice. Wax work for sale. Your business has hit hard times, it would seem. In short... You sold the infamous killer, the centerpiece of your special exhibit, for the sum of 200 pounds. No! Now, let us explore the next curiosity with which we are presented. Who is the portly gentleman stretched out so peacefully on the floor? It would appear the man has suffered a severe shock. The cause of which is clearly known to you. Unfortunately, madam, keeping secrets does not appear to be your forte. What dealt the man such a shocking blow was, of course, the 200 pounds. It would appear that you twisted this gentleman around your little finger most effectively. What are you suggesting? You rashly agreed to purchase the waxwork for the sum of 200 pounds? Only when he came to hand the money over did it occur to him what an, what an extortionate amount he was paying. But the money was no longer in his hands. And the result? The scene we see before us. He collapsed in shock. Yes, the killer in this special exhibit fetched a killer price. We can only pray that the gentleman's dreams are not plagued with regret. The question that arises then, is what has become of the waxwork that changed hands? Let us consider that problem for a moment. You, you cannot possibly... What immediately strikes me about this conundrum is the young man standing over there. Who is this fellow? To find the answer, we need only observe his neckerchief. Such as is worn by policemen as a secret sign to fellow members of the force that a crime is being perpetrated. Yes, this young man is an undercover policeman, currently investigating this museum. I know him well, in fact. It's Sergeant John Clay. What are you talking about? The man's quite a celebrity. He received triple accolades at last year's policing awards. But... Next, we turn our attention to the old man sat before him with the particularly unsightly visage. I've been watching closely as he hadn't moved, hasn't moved a muscle, almost in fact, as if he were a waxwork. Ah, uh, but, but you... Your reaction only confirms my suspicions, madam. I noticed it at once, of course. Observe. The telltale sign... That instantly proves whether or not this old man is a waxwork is the obvious price tag. Through pens, a tragically low price, you might say. Though perhaps the going rate for aging waxworks riddled with cracks. And yet you sold it to the portly gentleman. The sort of plucky behavior that's sure to attract the attention of Scotland Yard. Isn't that so, madam? I, I do not... Yes, the waxwork you sold has already been seized by the police and remains in their custody as we speak. The old man must be reunited with his grave in the special exhibit, and not a moment too soon. Thus concludes Herlock Sholmes' great deduction of this horrifying puzzle. I see I've stunned you all into silence. You have, Early. You have. 
and you've obviously upset this young lady in the process. Her cauldron looks hopefully hot. Hmm. If I could just bring up one point, Mr. Sholmes. Ah, the notorious Naruhodo one, one point. I'm all heroes, my dear fellow. According to your deduction, then, the special exhibit featured this old policeman. So, that would mean that he's the particular ruthless murderer, wouldn't it? The killer policeman, Ottermol. Sorry? It was a mysterious series of murders that rattled the capital only last year. The police rushed to the, to the scene every time, only to find the culprit had disappeared into the ether. And it, and it turned out the culprit was a policeman himself, a senior officer by the name of Hotromol. So you mean that's who the sinister looking old man there is supposed to be? Hmm... The name rings a bell, I think it may be a name that was already in, a, in another Sherlock Holmes story, no? Ah, uh, no, that was in um, Alfred Hitchcock Hour episode or something. That there was a Sergeant Ottermol. That may be where I heard the name then. Ah. Uh. Hmm. Or is it a book? Is it based on a book, maybe? I know it, it's in a. Um... Ah, it's a story by Thomas Burke, apparently. That's the name of the author. So that's got nothing to do with Sherlock Holmes per se, but. Hmm, okay. Indeed, it is a particularly grim face, is it not? Unforgettable, in fact. Yes, I remember that odious countenance only too well. But is 200 pounds a lot of money for a wax model? It would be enough to afford one of the latest steam carriages if that puts things in perspective. So, it is quite a lot, then. Is there anything else you wish to add? before I melt you down, but that bubbling wax is looking more and more ominous. Ah, uh, the smell of all that molten wax is starting to worry me. Mr. Sholmes did more or less just accuse her to her face, so... I think I might have to call on your assistance here, Iris, if that's alright, to make some minor correction to the cr corrections to the Great Detective's Great Deductions. Of course it's alright. We'll soon s set things straight? Yeah, okay. Well, let's get started then, shall we? Before Madame Tuspel's vents or hanger. Just what I was waiting to hear, my dear fellow. So, Madame Tuspel's, in accordance with our agreement, you shall now have the pleasure of seeing this famously great detective and temporary exhibit at work. Course correction. Hold it, Mr. Sholmes. To begin with, we must ask ourselves what exactly is afoot here in this museum. Yeah, hold on. Before anything. The answer is revealed by the bundle of banknotes protruding so helpfully from your bag. In my estimation, some 200 pounds. That... that is all my, mo my own money. So what does this large sum of money reveal? Ah, not as much as the involuntary glance you cast, it would seem, Madame Taspels. Yes, the answer lies where your eyes now fall. The significance of the 200 pounds is revealed by that public notice. Is that true? Wabazabaza, is that true? She definitely looked in this direction, it's true. But I'm not sure she'd sell any of her waxworks even for 200 pounds. 
Oh, she must pour her heart and soul into making them, don't you think? Over and above the wax. Is it perhaps that she's offering to make new ones? If you pay her? Maybe it's an offer of service, not of the good itself that she would be selling. No? If it were me, I wouldn't sell them for anything. Hmm. For that much money, I would. But it sounds like that makes me a bad person. Well, anyway, I wonder if the 200 pounds could have some other, other significance. Let's follow that furtive glance again and see if there's anything else that can explain it. What's that note doing pinned on the wall there? Oh, yes, let's see. Dear Madame Tespels, we've taken the prisoner from this room. The price for a safe return is 200 pounds. Have the money ready by noon on 23rd October. What? This this is it's just like the sort of thing that's left behind when someone is kidnapped. Yes, it's a ransom note. Exactly. That has to be it. The significance of the 200 pounds is revealed by that ransom note. Quite so, and we must congratulate these criminals on their inventiveness abducting a waxwork. Ah! 200 pounds is no, so, is no small ransom fee, yet you clearly intend to pay it. The model in question has special importance, so I put together all the money I have. In summary then, the 200 pounds you have in your handbag is ransom money. Now let us explore the next curiosity with which we are presented. Who is the portly gentleman stretched out so peacefully on the floor? It would appear the man has suffered a severe shock. The cause of which is clearly known to you. Unfortunately, madam, keeping secrets does not appear to be your forte. What dealt the man was such a shocking blow was of course the 200 pounds. So if the waxwork was kidnapped, what the, where does that leave us in terms of who this man is? Could just ask him when he comes around. I think the point of this exercise is to understand the beauty of the deduction process, Iris. Yes, you're right. Hurley is trying so hard, we mustn't let him down. Well, there's little doubt that he suffered a shock. That much seems clear. But in that case, what's Madame Tuspel's trying to hide? Let's have a closer look around. The hand? This is just Madame Tuspel's right hand, isn't it? Yes, it must be. I can clearly see your left hand after all. Oh, but wait a minute. This is a left hand as well. Look. Wait, what? What? <laughs> ah, yeah. If I put my right hand in my back, it wouldn't look that way. Yeah, indeed. D don't say such creepy things, Iris, please. And it seems very stiff too. In fact, it's really hard. Y you mean, it's made of wax? Did he pass out from that? What dealt the man such a shocking blow was of course the waxworked hand. Indeed, with a solid waxwork limb, one could deliver a very substantial blow. Oh, how, how, how could you? The hand protruding from the bottom of your cape, it ought to be a right hand, but closer inspection reveals that in fact it's a left hand. And somewhat masculine as well. In other words, it does not belong to you, madam. It is the hand of a waxwork model. Yeah! Some of the visitors to my museum can be troublesome. They meddle with the exhibits and cause damage. So you mean that arm. Yes, this gentleman saw fit to try to remove it as a souvenir. Hmm, no small keepsake. Like taking a whole branch of a cherry tree when you go to view the blossoms. I'm afraid I had to teach the man a lesson. You confronted the man and tried to take the arm back. And the result, the scene we see before us. He was knocked unconscious. At a point we may need to revisit later, but for the time being we have our conclusion. 
Yes, the killer in this special exhibit has been kidnapped. Kidnapped. Solved. The question that arises then is what has become of the waxwork that changed hands? Let us consider that problem for a moment. You, you cannot possibly... What immediately strikes me about this conundrum is the young man standing over there. Who is this fellow? To find the answer, we need only observe his neckerchief. According to Mr. Sholmes, the yellow neckerchief is assigned to other policemen that some crime is underway. A way of communicating with his colleagues without revealing his identity, yes. It's a secret that's closely guarded by Scotland Yard, that Mr. Sholmes didn't hesitate to give away. Well, uncovering secret is in, is in any true detective's nature, of course. Right. Anyway, judging from Madame Taspel's reaction to Mr. Sholmes' deduction, I think perhaps we might not have identified the, the man quite correctly. Oh. Yeah, I guess it had to be in 3D for you to be able to rotate the camera around. That's why I, I assumed at first that it was a, a real person. What the? The man has a stub sticking out of his shoulder where his, where his arm should be. Ah, well, that settles that then. Right, this isn't a real person at all. His entire arm has been ripped off from the shoulder down. His arm's been... Of course, that ties in with what we just found out. His shoulder stub. Who is this fellow? To find the answer, we need only observe his shoulder stub. No such boneless human walks this earth, of that I can assure you. In other words, the man standing here, the young Sergeant John Clay, is in fact, defying all odds, a waxwork model. I seem to remember it was you who concluded he was a real person in the first place, Mr. Sholmes. He has become quite a celebrity in London, being the winner of no less than three policing awards last year. I simply had to make a model of the man. Naturally, what other explanation could there be? And it was this detective's arm that was pulled off by the man on the floor in the special exhibit, wasn't it? Next, we turn our attention to the old man sat before him with a particularly unsightly visage. I've been watching closely and he hasn't moved a muscle, almost in fact as if he were a waxwork. Ah, but, but you, your reaction only confirms my suspicions, madam. I noticed it at once, of course. Observe. The telltale sign that instantly proves whether or not this old man is a waxwork is the obvious price tag. A killer policeman called Otramol, was it? Was he well known? It was all over the papers last year, but I can't say I know what he looks like. It's a very low price, though. Trupens is mu isn't much money. It's the price of the scarf. Only enough for a few measly hours of gas in Mr. Garadep's delightful lodgings, in fact. So this is the special killer taken from the special exhibit, is it? The waxwork that somebody stole from the museum and tried to ransom for 200 pounds. Is this crusty old killer policeman Otermol, really? Perhaps you should have a good look around again if another idea crops up. Oh, look at this! The old man's tapping his foot like crazy. He seems to be fast asleep, though. He's he's not tapping his foot consciously then, so you mean... It must be a twitch. Never mind that. The point is, waxworks don't tap their feet. Or twitch! And look at his arm, too. We've seen a scarf like that somewhere else around here, haven't we? Well, yeah, actually, I was thinking that it does ring a bell, but, uh... Where have I seen it? The telltale sign that instantly proves whether or not this old man is a waxwork is the obvious twitch. Even the most realistic waxworks do not exhibit a twitch. In other words, this splendid old man is in fact a genuine member of Scotland Yard. <laughs> Slight shift in your choice of adjectives then. And there you have it. Well, Madame Taspels, 
Well, what? It was me who contacted the police and demanded that someone come in the first place. He is clearly fatigued. He is sound asleep. But then, what's this tag about showing a price of three pence? No doubt the price tag of the muffler which the old Bobby purchased recently at the local market. And I presume you've observed the scarf tied around his arm. Does that not strike you, Mr. Nanohodo? He has the secret sign used by detectives to show that some criminal activity is currently on the way. Of course, because as you know, there has been just such criminal activity happening here, as you deduced from the very beginning, detective. So it would seem that we finally arrive at the truth. The waxwork of the especially ruthless killer from the special exhibit has been kidnapped. And Scotland Yard are already investigating. But the model's whereabouts remain a mystery. Thus concludes Herlock Sholmes' great deduction of this horrifying puzzle. All sorts of people visit my museum here, men and women, young and old. Sometimes they drop in just for a short time on their way back from the pub. I welcome them all, but if anyone tries to damage my exhibits, I do not take it lightly. Anyway. Your great deduction was even more enchanting than I had been led to believe. It was a pleasure, my dear madam. That'll be 50 shillings. <laughs> I'm gratified that you enjoyed the spectacle. And as for your rough customer, I've no doubt he'll regain consciousness shortly and return home. What concerns me more is the waxwork from the special display. If it was indeed genuinely abducted. Yes, tragically, it was. Then I would ask you to recount to us the events surrounding the stolen waxwork. In as much detail as possible, if you please. Very well, but after I have told you what I know, I must insist that you return to your work. The talents of a great detective could be put to better use, I feel, but as you wish. Mm. The Stolen Waxwork. Tell us more about the Stolen Waxwork, please. It was some days ago now, when I came in here one morning. I immediately noticed that the waxwork was missing from the special exhibit here. It is your most prominent display, so that's why the curtains were closed. And I found the ransom note in its place. The culprit must have broken in during the night and taken it then. So this waxwork that was stolen, it was a model of some horrible criminal, I suppose. Of a particularly horrible criminal, in fact. The killer who left a more profound scar on society than any other, I would say, the professor. Not a name I've heard of. So, Mr. Naruhodo, it seems the circle is complete. Sorry? The Professor case happened at around the time I was born, didn't it? Indeed it did, Iris. Ten years ago, a series of murders that rocked the capital. Ten years ago? Yes, at exactly the time. That Barack Van Zeeks graduated from university, in fact. What? Shirley is not saying... So the big event that changed Mr. Reaper's life? Have you surmised? It was the Professor Case. Who was this Professor then? It was a series of gruesome murders that the whole of London gripped in terror a, dec a decade ago. 
After five victims were killed, the man was arrested. And put to death. And now he's immortalized here in wax for all Londoners to admire and enjoy. Though, of course, he happens to be absent at present on account of the abduction. But I don't understand. How is all this related to Lord Van Zeeks? You must first understand, my dear fellow, why it is that the Professor earned such infamy. I was due to the victims he ch it was due to the victims he chose. Some of Whitehall's finest. What do you mean, early? Those murdered by the Professor were some of the highest members of the British aristocracy. The father of Van Zeeks, maybe? Died? Members of the nobility, even royalty, it sent shockwaves through the country's administration. Members of the... Ah, wait, of course. What Professor Airbrain said. Lord Van Zeeks is from a family with noble blood. Oh, gosh. It was the fifth victim that led to the professor's arrest. The last of the killer's prey was a young noble by the name of... Clint Van Zeeks. No, I don't believe it. Van Zeeks? I'm sure you can piece together the rest for yourself. In the wake of his older brother's... Ah, uh, older brother! Of his older brother's murder, the young Barak pursued a, a career as a prosecutor and eventually became the Reaper we know today. <sighs> I had no idea Lord Van Zeeks had such a tragic past. Well, I'm afraid that's all I can say on the matter, for the time being at least. After all, I have work to do. As a waxwork exhibit. I am afraid I shall have to excuse myself as well. Oh yes, of course. It's It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <sighs> well, none of the predicted scenarios I've been analyzing involved you coming to visit me here. It's been too long, it really has. I'm delighted to see you, Barak. It's been ten years, and here we are, meeting in a prison of all places. I can't forgive myself for what happened to Mr. Asman. I just can't. I, I still can't believe it could happen. Tomorrow the court will decide. Yes, I have a young Eastern man acting for my defense. He seems reliable enough, though. It, it was an accident, a terrible accident. He, he, he assures me he can prove it. I must warn you. Oh, I know, I know. I've heard already. You're going to be prosecuting, aren't you? Yes. Since I returned to England, I've heard lots of stories. Barak, are you really... What? The Reaper? Never mind. I know that you have my best interests at heart. My friend is on trial. I wouldn't entrust it to anybody else. Of course, I fully understand. Thank you, Barak. Until tomorrow, then. I'll see you in court. To be continued. At trial part one. Okay. I can't believe it's been six months since I was last allowed to work in court. And now here I am, back at the old Bailey. Ah, um, Mr. Naruhodo. Good morning, Professor Hairbrain. I don't understand, it doesn't make any sense. The atmospheric pressure in, in here is off the charts. I've never felt anything like it. It's, it's crushing me. I feel it every time I'm here, that gravity. <laughs> well, this is Britain's highest court. But are you telling me it's fitted with some kind of device that can actually control air pressure? I think it's probably all in the mind. 
Ah, yes, well, you won't let me down, will you, Mr. Naruhodo? I'm counting on you into this trial to save my life! To save the secret of my super high voltage instantaneous kinesis machine from being made public! Yes, I understand. I know what I have to do. I have to establish that the explosion two days ago was nothing more than an unfortunate accident. Well, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about, really. Justice will prevail. My commiserations, Mr. Naruhodo. You appear to have been lumbered with a most tiresome case here. Mr. Sholmes, I didn't expect to see you here. <coughs> that was very mean, Runo, leaving me alone at home with Early. Oh, I did that? It took me at least an hour to make it to wake him. Uh oh. Uh is it are you Herlock Sholmes? <laughs> Indeed, sir, I am he. Herlock Sholmes. Oh, I've heard all about your exploits, even whilst living in Germany. Ah yes, Ranst magazine is on sale in Germany too. This month's installment was sublime. Your deduction in the adventure of Silver Blaze was wonderful. Ah yes, a memorable case indeed. It concerned the snake, I seem to recall. No, that was the speckled band. Well, thank you for coming. I do appreciate your support. I'm sorry to disappoint you, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid I can't stay. I have urgent business at Madame Tuspel's. You mean your waxwork job? No, no, the waxwork abduction, of course. Madame has engaged my services. Ah, so you're trying to get to the bottom of that ransom note, are you? The week's wages depend on it, as does the safe return of the waxwork, naturally. As such, I intend to give it my undivided attention. Oh, well, never mind then, I understand. Of course, with my skills of observation and reasoning, resolving the matter will be as easy as a pro as proverbial... as what? Pro proverbial pie. Okay. I shall return forthwith. For until I solve the case, I shall have no money to afford a pie of any description. <laughs> oh, then you must absolutely give it your full attention early. <laughs> quite, Iris, quite, but life is riddled with irony, you know? Whenever I give something my full attention, I have a quite insatiable desire for a pie. One of the universe's int intractable mysteries, you might say. Oh yes, quite, definitely, absolutely, I totally understand. Is someone a little starstruck? I wish you the very best of luck, Professor Hairbrain. Oh, ah, oh, why, thank you. Before I depart, Mr. Naruhodo, a word in your ear, if you please. In your ear. What's this about? As you have remarkably little grounding in science, I feel I ought to inform you. As compelling as the super high voltage instantaneous kinesis hypothesis may be, a practical implementation such as was attempted by the professor at the Grace exhibition is quite impossible. But the professor said the demonstration was a success. Yes, it would appear that he fervently believes it was. I've read Professor Bunny Brain's paper about it too, Runo, and I have to say, I'm sure it can't be done. It could barely be done theoretically, let alone practically. So he's completely barking up the wrong tree? But how could an experiment that had no possibility of succeeding in fact succeed? That's contradictory. And it's that contradiction that will be at the heart of the trial, I've no doubt. What's that supposed to mean? Now I must hurry along. I wish you the best of luck, my dear fellow. See you later, Hurley. Well, it looks like you're on your own today, Runo, but chin up, you can do it. Oh, what about you, Iris? Uh, no, I'm afraid I can't help. I have something I need to do. I see. <laughs> it's going to be a big surprise for you when you find out what it is. Ah, that sounds ominous. Counsel for the defense and the defendant. Court is about to be in session. Make your way into the courtroom at once. We're on our way. 
An experiment that the laws of science say can't possibly succeed, and a scientist who's convinced that it did. That's the riddle you have to unlock here, Ryunosuke. That's the key to this case. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session. We are sitting today for the public trial of Professor Halber Albert Hairbrain. I now call upon the counsels for the prosecution and defense to declare their willingness to proceed. The prosecution is ready. The defense is... The defense is ready, my lord. I'm six months out of practice, and what's more... I am without Sato-san today. Ah, is it just my imagination, or does the air in here feel even more oppressive than usual? So, I must say I recollect the victim of this case all too well, Mr. Odi Asman. Mr. Asman was well known as a fine and cheer, though that was merely a front for his diverse criminal activities. It was only a month ago that the man appeared in court prosecuted by you, Lord Van Zeeks, but the jury unanimously found him not guilty. Because every member of the jury had been bribed by the sound of it. These powerful London criminals are prepared to go to extreme length to keep their freedom. But two days ago, on the 21st of October, Mr. Asman met his end. The work of the Reaper, was it? If that is how your lordship would describe divine retribution... But the fact remains that Mr. Asman's death was a direct result of the actions of the accused, Professor Hairbrain. Very well then. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected at random to represent the will of the people. Are the six of you ready to fulfill your societal duty? Who's this guy? I am most gratified to have been selected to carry out this important civic duty, my lord. She's new too? To have a man's fate in the palm of one's hand. Oh gosh, oh golly, it sends shivers down my spine. This one's new too, I think. Science experiments, magic conjuring tricks, courtroom trials, all are nothing more than performances. Any spurious scholar that defiles the reputation of science deserve to hang. Heh <laughs> We have to listen to what's said on both sides' defense, and um, then settle on one. That's it, isn't it? Hey, this guy is here too. Wasn't like this in my day. Wasn't like this at all. That's... that's... The police killer Otomo look-alike. Again. And he's as exhausted as ever, it seems. Now, as I'm sure you are all aware, the incident we are here to judge today tragically took place at the Great Exhibition shortly after its opening. Though the death toll could have been far worse, with the exception of the victim, no one was killed. Nevertheless, the dream of the science being exhibited rapidly turned into a nightmare for the spectators. A tragic turn of events, and as such, the eyes of all London, no, of the, wo the whole world will be on this trial. It is our duty to reach a swift and just conclusion, I feel. So, your opening statement, please, Lord Van Zeeks. At the heart of this incident is technology never before demonstrated anywhere in the world. One of science's latest developments, I take it. The government is keen to capitalize on the Great Exhibition to improve Britain's technological advantage. The technology being demonstrated by the accused was described as super high voltage instantaneous kinesis. Good lord! It's designed to disassemble human subjects using extremely high voltage electricity and beam them instantly to another location where they are subsequently reassembled. Is, is such a thing even within the realm of, of possibility? Well, I don't believe it, that's for sure. Disassembling people with electricity, my goodness, how shocking. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, the whole idea is absurd. The hypothesis would never stand up to scrutiny. Sir, I believe you are a fellow of the Royal Society, are you not? An expert in your field? 
I am, and my word on the matter can be considered final. Instantaneous kinesis is poppycock. So this expert and Mr. Sholmes are in agreement. It's impossible. What is the prosecution's view on the matter? The prosecution would assert... ...that the accused's instantaneous kinesis demonstration was a success. What? What rot? Hordar! Hordar! The professor's hypothesis is currently under investigation by the British government. If it is deemed to have merit, a substantial research grant would be made available. The accused made use of the invention built on his new hypothesis to take Mr. Asman's life. In order to be the sole benefactor of the grant. But... but... This disastrous... Ah, yeah, it was a success in that sense, then. Yeah, okay. This disastrous demonstration was no accident. It was carefully designed from the outset to end the life of the victim. Thank you, Lord Van Zeeks. The prosecution's stance is clear. But you will now bring forth witnesses to substantiate your claims. Gladly, my lord. Bailiff, show the first witnesses to the stand. Witnesses, state your names and occupations for the court. Yes, sir. Tobias Gregson, Detective Inspector at Scotland Yard's Homicide Division. I was on duty at the demonstration on the day in question and in charge of the following investigation. Albert Hairbrains, scientist. You were born in England, but have been carrying out research in Germany in recent years, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. After graduating from university here in Britain, I went to work in Germany and made an amazing discovery. Which is what brought me back. I had to demonstrate my incredible hypothesis at the Great Exhibition. What you demonstrated was incredible, alright. An incredible explosion. <laughs> But the science! The science was a success! The instantaneous kinesis worked! Everyone saw it! They must have done! Yes, there was the terrible accident, but... The demonstration of my hypothesis was a success! Well, that much is undeniable, as shown in this photograph taken by the forensic investigation team. This was taken inside the Crystal Tower, I take it? The centerpiece of the exhibition, no less. That's right, my lord. Seems the victim rammed straight into it. Hmm, I see. Very well. Submit the photograph as evidence. The photograph of the victim has been entered into the court record. As the courts heard, the victim of the incident was Mr. Oddie Asman. There have been a number of allegations made against the man, but putting them aside for the time being, he was the man who financed the research for the experiment and the demonstration itself. I see, so to summarize the situation, the defendant is accused of taking the life of the man who funded his work. Would that be correct? Exactly. But couldn't it be that the explosion was caused by some malfunction in the apparatus used for the demonstration? That's right, that must be it, my splendid machine, my poor splendid machine! You saw it yesterday, didn't you? We can't even examine the wreckage thanks to the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. What? The wreckage? The wreckage? But that being the case, how can the facts be established? How can it possibly be determined whether this was an accident or a deliberate and malicious act? Extremely simply, my lord. I beg your pardon? Isn't that right, witness? What? Sorry? Me? No, your neighbor. Yes, sir. It was murder, plain and simple. Anyone could state that with complete certainty. What? How can he possibly think that? Thank you, Inspector. I think we had better proceed to formal testimony. Hmm. You will explain to the court on what grounds you claim this experiment to have been a front for murder.
Excuse me. Okay, there we go. Right. A front for murder. The corpse that went crashing through the crystal tower at a broken neck. I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection. That's all. That was my mistake. But the post-mortem examination revealed another injury. A fatal wound. There was a lesion in his chest where he'd clearly been stabbed by something sharp right in the heart. So the victim was killed before he went anywhere. And this fella's the only one who could have done it. No, 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 the crossbow, I think. This is where we're going. An extraordinary business. In addition to suffering a broken neck, the victim was stabbed in the heart? Information I would really like to have heard from someone other than the judge. The coroner says death would have been all but instant from a wound like that. You could say, in fact, that the victim was killed twice by the accused. No, no, and no, that couldn't be further from the truth. I have here the experiment document that was submitted to the security team. The victim stood himself inside something called the birdcage, ready to be beamed instantly. To the second level of the crystal tower, about 25 yards away. The experiment did not go according to plan, however. As the machine was put into operation, there was a large explosion. The blast caused the beam transmitter to point higher than intended. Accordingly, the kinesis resulted in the birdcage materializing in midair. From where it subsequently fell, crashing through the glass of the crystal tower's large round window. My word! One assumes the victim's neck was broken upon impact with the, ta with the tower, then. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen. The machine was just too powerful. But honestly, really, I swear it was just an accident. A terrible accident. Unfortunately, that excuse can't save you. No, not considering the sharp murder weapon that pierced the victim's heart. Murder weapon? What are you saying? This is the autopsy report submitted by the coroner. The prosecution would like it entered into the court record. Your request is granted, counsel. The autopsy report has been entered into the court record. Stabbed in the chest with a sharp object. Okay. That's what I should focus on. I was there in person, you know. I saw the whole ludicrous performance. And the only other person on the stage with Mr. Asmund was that disgraceful excuse for a scientist. Then really, by all accounts, it must have been him. Hmm, hard to think otherwise, really. Yeah, proceed with the cross-examination. Sorry. I need to focus here. It's been a while. Okay, let's try something right off the bat. Uh, let me save first. I will only be a few more minutes, by the way, before I end the stream, but I just want to try that out. No, we can't yet. Okay, well... That would have been too easy, right? Well, I'll leave the rest for tomorrow then. I just wanted to try that out because that seemed obvious to me, but uh, if that's not the case, then uh, we'll try tomorrow then. Maybe by then, because ne right now I have to think about how I want to go about this and I'm running out of time to do so anyway, to uh, get through the whole cross-examination. So let's stop here. I'll be back tomorrow afternoon and we'll continue this case. Finish it tomorrow? Maybe this case? I'm not sure, but we'll see. Take it easy, people. I shall see you tomorrow, whatever the case may be. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.